Amazing, oh, that's amazing how as an artist you turn into a manager and everything shifts from there. I don't know if it's a weakness or if it's just me or I'm sure there are other people like that. I want to try different things, you know? Point one thing that I think was pretty unhealthy was the studio that I worked at was more important than my name. Like I loved being like, hi, Brian Wynia, Sony Santa Monica, nice to meet you. <laughs> Going from a really horrible high school student, it was important to me to be like, just do whatever you want to do and try to find a way to make a living of it. People are, are positively affecting the project just due to that balance of being able to kind of like wake up in your PJs, grab a cup of coffee, and start making stuff. There was hard work and stuff involved, but yep. there's definitely a stroke of luck in there as well. I got a job at this haunted house. They were the first company to professionally pay me to not only be a monster, but make monsters. Yeah, I'm a, I was started recording because all the good re good moments happens before I started recording. Now I'm already recording, so so that's good. 100%. So awesome. let's let's do it, man. Uh, glad to have that's you, good. Brian. It's great to talk to you finally and see you face to face. Thank <laughs> Even you. Yeah, it's a Zoom I call. Uh, appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, it's man. weird, right? But like we've become accustomed to this because yeah. after like a global pandemic. Uh, so it's weird, but it's also really positive. So yeah, uh, I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit, but yeah, thank you for the invite. It's awesome to finally talk to you and get to meet you properly. Same man. Any, anytime. It's great to always talk to great people. We had a small conversation just now and I can mm -hmm. already say that this is going to be a great one. <laughs> I'm I, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this on kind of just like, you know, we were talking about our age earlier and yeah. where we're at in our careers and um, yeah, just talking about some things, you know, almost like they're they're tangents of artwork, but how they relate to one another. Yeah. You yeah. know, um, so, yeah, I'm excited. I love your uh, I love your shows. They're awesome. Thanks. You know, my my wife, I've been with my wife since I was 18. Right. So she's been, yeah, long time. Right. So we're officially at the point where we've been with each other for like half of our lives. And she does a great job of keeping me super humble. Right. So like no matter what video games I work on or movies, you know, you're, she still remembers when I was like 18 or 19, like making rubber Halloween masks in my mom's garage. Right. Um, but it's so funny, right before the pandemic, I was promoted to uh, creative director at Tripwire Interactive. And then the pandemic hit and we're working from home. And my wife got a very like real uh, kind of view of what it would be like me being a creative director and working. And she just, you know, like I'm, I'm at my house. This is my office and my dog or one of my kids is going to probably run by in a little bit or my wife might grab a package. Like the front door is right there. And um, I'll be in conversations like all day meeting with designers and artists and, you know, directing, communicating, giving feedback and forming and inspiring. And uh, she's like, maybe it's like the first week after we were, you know, kind of working from home. She's like, you don't like draw or sculpt at all at work anymore, do you? I'm like, no, as creative director, I really got to make sure I can delegate and give people the information they need to succeed. And so she's like, so you're talking all day i was like pretty much there's a little there's a little writing in there as well and she's just like ah she normally spell checks me as well so she's just like they're definitely taking you out of your comfort zone so that's amazing oh that's amazing how as an artist you turn into a manager and everything shifts from there it's no longer oh, what you expected goodness, it's no longer man. what you you planned for you know <laughs> yeah it's um it's interesting and things change and you know we were talking about this beforehand. Like I, I did not, I didn't, I don't know what my career goal really was. I know that I am obsessed with making monsters and characters and telling stories, whether that's through movies or video games or just a few images. Right. Yeah. Um, so when Tripwire gave me the opportunity to become a creative director, you know, I, I knew it was going to be incredibly different. Uh, but company? I was really looking forward to the challenge. Uh, Tripwire Interactive. So um, uh, recently we, um, you know, right kind of not at the beginning, I would say about maybe a year ago, we did, uh, we released Maneater, 
uh, which is like a shark PG is what we called it, where you play as a shark and there's kind of these RPG elements to it. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a tripwire publishing where we just recently published uh, Chivalry. So Torn Banner and the guys at Tripwire Publishing did an awesome job bringing that together. It's called AAA um, Publishing? Uh, tripwire Publishing. Oh, uh, Tripwire. So, yeah, Tripwire. And you can also just go to Tripwire Interactive uh, and you can kind of get a glimpse this is the company, the company that you work for? It is. Oh, it is. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. So, I, well, I got to be honest. It, it's kind of like if you look at my Instagram, a lot of it is like my freelance work and concept artwork, yeah. uh, sketches for movies. Uh, at Tripwire, we have a, a pretty strong work-life balance. And one of the things that really drew me to Tripwire is I have the ability to freelance, make my own games, teach, write a book, do events like this. Mm -hmm. um they actually really encourage it so that's amazing outside of being the creative director at tripwire i also work as a creature designer for uh various films and television shows you really uh, do amazing I, work man I, lo I love your creatures and you. it's 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 uh, really amazing to see you know you focus on one thing and you're just doing that i don't know how you do it because like for me it's it's great right when you focus on something you can push it to the next mm -hmm. level and improve and so on uh, that was actually more of my, that's i don't know if it's a weakness or if it's just me or i'm sure there are other people like that i want to try different things you know well i it's interesting because a lot of times this is where i think as artists that imposter syndrome or looking at social media it, it's hard I, like I would love to do robots and hard surface and environments and animation. Like I, I have a, a hunger for all of it, but when I really break it down to like, I have free time, my kids are asleep, work is done. What do I want to do? I want to make mm -hmm. monsters. I want to tell stories with these images. Um, I notice after a while, I, I found a way to not make it like um, where it was an issue. But I just was trying to be true to myself and listen to myself where, you know, this is what I want to do. So I'm going to just pour everything into that. And I, I do agree I had to diversify to some degree where it's not just doing creature concept art or not just doing creature character artwork. Uh, I used to uh, very early in my career kind of market myself as uh, character and creature development. Mm -hmm. So that could be everything from sketches to concept art to, um, you know, consultation, um, character artwork, anything to help projects with developing characters and creatures to help tell their stories. The goal that I was trying to do is when someone would say monsters, you would think of Brian Wanya. Or when you would hear my name, you would think of that the monster guy. So right? how, did, how did you realize that you should focus on this? Because, uh, you know, I get a lot of questions. I'm sure you get it too. People ask, uh, you know, I don't know what to choose. Should I be a character artist? Mm -hmm. Should I be an environment artist? I just want to do this, but I don't know what I want to do. I think it comes down to like I went to the Art Institute of Atlanta uh, and the nice thing about Art Institute of Atlanta was I have a, um, a degree in media arts and animation. It was a really broad thing uh, and we went through everything from, you know, traditional animation, traditional life drawing, still life. It was very broad. We had a bunch of 3D animation classes, you know, particle effects. ZBrush 2 was kind of a thing coming out at that point, but we really didn't even have classes for ZBrush at that point. Like I had to go out of my way and find them. I just really dated myself there, didn't I? Yeah, we are. I I, I'll never you. forget. <laughs> yeah, I was like so excited about ZBrush when it came out. And like I, at that point, I was like, oh, I heard about it. And there was like one Nomen DVD on it. Yes. And I'll never forget. <laughs> there was like one Nomen yeah. DVD. And I would like ask for those for Christmas from my parents. And was and it I'll Alex never Alvarez? I think it was, it was <laughs> Alex Alvarez. Yeah. And he was and even then, everything. like, he was teaching everything. And even that video, I think it was like not just ZBrush. There was like quite a few things in there. Like maybe there was some mental ray and stuff like that. Um, but it just kind of like caught my eye. And I, I think the other thing was, is that degree was my backup plan. The real oh, wow. plan was to move out to LA and work at a makeup effects studio. 
because so I'm like 38. I'm a kid of the 80s. I grew up on a steady diet of rubber monster movies and slasher movies. And I got to intern at a really small effects studio here in Atlanta, Georgia called Lone Wolf Effects. It was literally one dude. Uh, this guy is basically like I have the same relationship with him as I do my father, basically. Like this wow. guy is my mentor. I was his second intern, uh, Scott Spencer. Uh, or uh, Was it know, a Scott Spencer? Yes. She, yeah. Well, Scott Spencer, yeah. Scott Spencer was the first intern for this guy. So that effects company was oh, called wow. Lone Wolf Effects. And that's kind of how I got my start in LA where uh, this guy, Bill Splat Johnson, who owns Lone Wolf Effects, he was like, I had one other intern before you. And, you know, he liked this ZBrush thing. Mm. And so Scott at that time was the art director of uh, Gentle Giant and invited me out. But it's crazy how like one thing led to another but I think the point is, like, when we talk about all this stuff, I got to try a bunch of things. And mm -hmm. I noticed the thing that I kept always coming back to was monsters, right? Yeah. Whether it was reading comics, the types of video games that I would play, the type of art that I was making. Um, when I was a kid, you know, it was like, hey, maybe you're, you got ADD. Like, I wasn't the best high school student. I was in high school for like four and a half years, right? Like, Dude, talk about like learning humility. It's like having to stay in high school for like an extra semester. It was, it was brutal. Uh, like it, it really gave me a healthy dose of like what it felt like to fail and what that tasted like and just being like, oh, I don't, don't like that. I don't want to do that again. Um, so going from a really horrible high school student it was important to me to be like, just do whatever you want to do and try to find a way to make a living of it. Mm. I remember like as a kid seeing a special with Rick Baker and it was on Harry and the Hendersons. And when I saw that as a kid, I was like, oh shit, there are people that make a living making monsters. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, well, we'll just do that. You know? <laughs> just, um, just make monsters and live. Yeah, and and over time, it's definitely evolved. Like the idea of being a, you know, monster maker at a, a rubber, you know, effect shop, classically like that. Mm -hmm. That industry has changed a lot, and and thankfully, I have been able to work for a lot of the studios that I grew up, you know, um, admiring. Like I, I worked on uh, the last two Godzilla films oh, wow. uh, through Studio ADI where I was okay. helping them on the design team. Uh, I got to work with guys like Aaron Sims. I've worked with the Le Legacy Effects. So that makeup effects background while learning ZBrush through Scott and Gentle Giant and places like Noman, it definitely kind of helped um, pave the path. Th that's one thing I tell a lot of young artists is like, the more you do, the more you get to do, which I actually think is a quote from like Tom Savini. There's this book that I got oh. as a kid. Yeah, the more you do, the more you get to do. And, and, and I've noticed that we're like, when you first get started in the industry, like you are like ready to take on the world, right? Where you're just <laughs> like, I just, I just graduated James Cameron. Tell me what you need me to make. I got it. Right. <laughs> and then you realize and you're it's like, not like that. <laughs> yeah. You have, I, I'll never forget. Like when I first graduated school, even like, so here's the thing too, that was interesting. I was so obsessed with like graduating high school. Well, as a junior in college, I got my internship at Gentle Giant. So I flew out to California and I worked there for like seven months. And at the end of that seven months, they were like, Hey, uh, we want to send you to Canada to go do some like digital scanning and prepping mm -hmm. files for like whatever fast and the furious that was maybe like four or five. I don't, once again, I'm dating myself. Uh, <laughs> but I was like, Oh no, I, I can't go work on the fast and furious movie. I have to go home and finish my degree. And they're just like, we'll just give you a job. You know, and I was like, nope, I got to have my degree, got to go home. And they're like, we can't guarantee that in a year this job will still be open for you. Are you sure? And I was like, yep. Wow. Definitely would probably have redone it, but I guess things happen for a reason, right? Yes. So I came home and I finished my degree and I knew exactly what I was going to do. I, ZBrush 3.1 was out at the time. I just focused on sculpting. I was like trying to look at like uh, some of like uh, Bernini's work and like it was the most. 2007. Dude, yeah, like the most obligatory 
like intro to ZBrush type stuff that I was trying to do, right? Like it was all like lumpy old men in ZBrush 3.1. I think that's what ZBrush Central looked like at the time, right? <laughs> yes. Because every, like, everyone wanted to do we, details, right? I mean, that's uh, it, right? Moving from polygons. Multiple sub tools. Yes. Oh my God. I'm going to put eyeballs in the mesh today. It's going to get crazy. <laughs> I don't have yeah. to bring in one thing at a time. Um, now but you yeah, can so I was fortunate. Enough. Dude, it's crazy. Like, it's so funny when I see things now, or even like I have students when I teach like intro to ZBrush, they're like, you know, you can do this, 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 and this. And I'm like, I just sculpt, man, make it easy. <laughs> Don't get complicated. But I was fortunate enough to go, to go back, um, to gentle giant. And yeah, I just learned a ton there. But when I was going back, I was supposed to be doing concept art for Alice in Wonderland, Tim mm. Burton. And I was like, I've made it. This is it. Like I've worked my whole life. And I'll never forget, I think I was doing concept art for like a day. And then there was another job because General Giant had a variety of different types of jobs and things that would come through. And it was like, we need you to sculpt um, a mug, like a like a cup for Barnum and Bailey Circus, like an elephant mug. And I was what? just like, <laughs> what? A mug? That's, that's not what I... What I worked hard to do. I've right? trained my whole life, yeah. <laughs> and then, like, so I, I was like, well, listen, it, you're the new guy. Don't complain. Get it done. I, I, I burned through it. I did a good job. And then it was the next thing. It was like, hey, we need you to process the scan data of the Alamo. Wow. Like, the location in Texas, the Alamo, there was, like, scan data. That's and I was crazy. just like, dude, this, is, this isn't what I thought it would be. But I tried to take those opportunities as ways to learn things. Because, like, at that point, I had, like, no game experience. Dude, I was taking art tests trying to get into game studios. Uh, I took a, a – I don't know how much of this I can say or not, but I, like, I took a test for um, – Blizzard, which I think this project is, it was before Overwatch became Overwatch. It was this massive art test. And it was the first time I ever baked a normal map. Wow. Like was literally for my art test. I had, I had no right even taking the test, but they were nice enough to give it to me. And uh, so I think that was a perfect example of like, even though it was a failure, that experience I learned, I was just like, oh, dude, like you're not ready for this yet. This is what you need to do. So I would, at General Giant, we would be uh, doing these like UFC uh, fighters for action figures. Mm -hmm. Those UFC fighters had the best topology ever. Like, because I didn't know anything about like how to properly create edge loops for animation. Like I had basic knowledge of like, okay, yeah. avoid end gons and this and watch out for these shapes. But that was one of the things I noticed I needed to work on at that point was just like remeshing Which year sculpts. Is this? Oh man, this is probably maybe like 2008, oh, wow. 2009 ish, yeah. right? Um, and from that, I was like, so I would take extra time like during lunch, like, because normally that you could still like Dynamesh wasn't out, but you could just like subdivide the hell out of a mesh and just yeah. sculpt on it. And if there was any imperfections, you just kind of polish it back. Like uh, the type of work we were doing didn't need perfect topology, but I was like, I, I want to find every opportunity to kind of teach myself this and, and learn that. And I would go home and do more stuff. Um, and then there was an opening at Naughty Dog for a junior character artist. And I was like, this is a like a perfect opportunity. And I happened to be taking a digital sculpting class with a character artist named Tyler Breon. Mm -hmm. uh, Tyler Breon worked at Sony Santa Monica at the time, but previously worked at Naughty Dog. So I was like, Tyler, mm -hmm. they've got this opening. Do you have any recommendations? And he was like, sure. Like, this is what you're going to need to work on. Uh, so I really owe a lot to, you know, like Tyler. Uh, for helping kind of giving me a peek behind the curtains. And dude, that's like one thing for your audience that I will say that is a tough pill to swallow is being in LA is such an advantage. Like yeah. I grew up on the East coast in the States, Atlanta, Georgia, pretty small. Like there's a lot of movies being filmed here now, but everything like all the big effect shops, everything was in LA. You know, what's and, weird you say LA, uh, I moved uh, originally from Iran, and now mm -hmm. I live in Washington, and I had multiple opportunities to work in LA, and I rejected all of them. It's just it's, life happened to, that's where I wanted to work, but life happened to be this way, 
and um, I actually I'm actually happy with it. It's so funny, and I, I think that's part of us just getting older. Because like I'm I'm back in Atlanta, right? And you I know. actually moved back to Atlanta twice. I can't go like, back to I was, <laughs> I'm happy. Oh here. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I almost ended up in Washington as well. Like I have a friend at Arena Net, and um, I one thing I learned working at Bills, like the effect shop. Mm -hmm. is like things happen for a reason and like don't get overly excited until things happen and don't play the game of like what if you know like what would have happened if i ended up at arena net or like what would have happened if i got the job at blizzard right like you're gonna drive yourself insane doing that like things happen yeah. for a reason stay persistent but like for me as a kid of the 80s being obsessed with making monsters uh hollywood was like the place to go yeah. and i only lived there for five or six years um, with my wife at the time. And those first five years, like I was like, I'm never going to leave here. This, like the sky's the limit. I could throw a rock outside and hit somewhere or something that I wanted to be a part of. It was, to be honest, like I have a, a slightly, I don't want to say addictive personality, but you know, like I'm, look, I'm sitting in a room full of monsters and skulls. Like yeah. if I'm into something, I'm into it. And in LA, it was very hard for me to have balance, right? Like work-life balance where I'm going to focus on me, I'm going to focus on my family, and I'm going to focus on work. When I was there, I just wanted to work the whole time. And then when we had my our, our first daughter, um, that really kind of put things in perspective. And we, that's the first time we moved back to Atlanta. What I age? worked for a company called Hi Um Oh, I know Hi-Riz. Yeah, I was... My daughter was a year old. I think that was maybe 10 years ago now. Oh, wow. Yeah, Your daughter is like, 11 years like old? She's like nine. Nine? Uh, yeah, my daughter. Yeah, my oldest, she is nine. She'll be 10 in September. And then I have a five-year-old. Oh, wow. So, and, <laughs> ah, but, but dude, like, That's yeah, amazing. talk about life, man. Like perspective, uh, things change. Because even for me, like I, I enjoyed my time at high res, but it was incredibly brief. When I was in LA, I worked at Naughty Dog. I worked at Sony Santa Monica. Um, I went to high res, but at high res, I was, I, at that point, one thing that I think was pretty unhealthy was the studio that I worked at was more important than my name. Like I loved being like, hi, Brian Wynia, Sony Santa Monica, nice to meet you. <laughs> you know, yeah. like my, my title was who I was. And uh, I, I think, Hopefully that's a sign of maturity that I was able to disconnect from that. I think that happens to everyone at some point. You don't. Um, yeah, I, I know what you mean exactly. Because if you look at like I'm, I'm looking at myself, it was important for me. To, where am I working? Which studio is, um, you know, yes. part of. Now it doesn't matter anymore. Now it's just like, OK, that's part of life. It's I don't know. For some reason, before age 30, we give so much value to that. It's good. Yeah. Right. But there is. I don't know. Maybe it's not as as important as we we used to highlight it. You know what I mean? Not trying I, to discredit that. I think that. so for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying like well, people might might actually take it the wrong way. I mean, I'm not yes. saying that it's bad because for me, my life changed because I worked in this industry, worked for different studios, mm -hmm. improved my knowledge, worked with different people, connected to people like you. So that's that's valuable, right? And what makes those companies is like these people that are making the team. But, it's super important, but yeah. you're not your job, right? Yes. Like that's the thing. Like, and and I think at that point, I I've noticed, like as a creative director, I contribute a lot more to the project than I did when I was like a junior character artist on like Uncharted Two. Like, ah, I made Drake's watch, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, my contribution was this much, but what I felt like the company was more of a value to me than I might've been to the company just based on, on how it was. And I'm not saying you shouldn't work hard. You absolutely should work hard because, you know, like I, I love this industry, but like you, you are an individual as well and you need to do the things that make you happy. I will never forget talking to Zach Petrock, right? Like that was oh. another one of those early Nomen DVDs. I want to talk when to I him was as a, well. All the guys you're mentioning, dude, it's hard to catch with like they are. Well, they're, they're, they're the OG ones, right? Yeah, like they're yeah, the big yeah. dogs that the first time I ever saw a ZBrush model it was from Zach Petrock. Yes, yes. Me too. And I'll never forget my first week at Gentle Giant, Scott like here date myself again i had to take a physical flash drive to zach's house 
So like <laughs> as an intern, it was like, hey, take this over. And I was like, all right. Uh, I was living in uh, like that was in the Burbank area. Everything is like 20, 30 minutes away from each other in Burbank. Uh, yeah. it, it was such a cool place to be. And I remember going going to his house and just being like, oh, hello, sir. I'm dropping off the USB file. And he was like, hey, come on in. Like, do you want to see my studio? He has like a little detached or I remember he had like an office or something. And I was like, sure. And uh, I think they were like wrapping up dinner. His wife asked me if I wanted anything. He was just like so incredibly nice. Yeah. And I'll never forget, like, I wouldn't say I'm close with Zach, but the few interactions I've had with him were impactful. And I'll never forget, like, he was also teaching a class at the school where I met Tyler. And I was, it was like a, it was like a, a life drawing class or, but we were like sculpting models, excuse me. And uh, I was telling him, like, I wanted to leave General Giant and I wanted to work in games and this or that. And I remember him talking about the importance of like not going to a studio because what they're making, but go to a studio because how they treat you. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, okay, like this is starting to make sense, but it didn't really kick in in all honesty until probably tripwire. Cause even like I went to, after I left high res, I went to id software where I worked on uh, doom 2016. Uh, when did, did you a little work? bit of stuff. When were you at, uh, which year? 2014, 15? Uh, yeah, roughly that. Like, cause uh, I was there at the end of 2016. You know why I ask? Sorry um, to, to, I don't no, just please. remember what you want to say. So I can add this okay. right around that time. I was moving from uh, Florida to San Francisco to work for Ubisoft. And then I got an email okay. from, uh, it's software from I think he was the general manager of the company, and I think it was because I made a statue of Doom. I actually have it here. It's not here. It's like oh, that's awesome. Me. Yeah, I, they have it in the office. I think I don't know exactly. I don't remember exactly, but I was like, unfortunately, I accepted an offer at Ubisoft, so I can't come there. I think you were there at the time, maybe. <laughs> Dude, it was it was an awesome place to work. I I absolutely loved it. And to be honest, if it's funny how things happen, right? Like, you know, I was telling you one of the first, um, one of the first art tests I took was for Blizzard and I failed it super hard. When I was leaving id, I was interviewing with Blizzard and Tripwire. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because I was looking to leave, but I was approached and I was just like, let's hear what they have to say, right? Yeah. And in the end, I think Blizzard had a, a, a very interesting uh, project and offer and presentation, but it wasn't the right fit for me. I enjoyed what I had at id, but Tripwire and the things that they were offering and the projects they had lined up and the opportunity for career growth and the ability to be back in Atlanta, I couldn't say no to. So I, like I said, it's funny how you mature over time. Cause even like I left high res because I wanted to be making monsters again and id software really pulled me in with what they were pitching for me. And um, it provided me a, a, a great opportunity to, to learn from a really talented team there. Um, Tripwire, their work life balance though. I, I, it's amazing. And I love being a part of a really small team. Mm. what's more Your important to you impactful. yeah you're definitely on a small team you will definitely be more impactful but you know yeah the reason i ask what's more important to you is because of all the things we said right the studio is important because the other day i had a live with a group of people from brazil it's really nice people uh, they were interviewing me and then mm -hmm. um so one person in the chat said how did you feel when you started working in big companies and then when you worked on this game and that game and it was weird because for me the feeling was like i if i think about it i didn't have any feelings not not that i didn't care about it right but it was the right yeah. decision to do it's not it wasn't emotional like when i think about it i took those decisions because it was good for me. It was a good experience. I would learn something. But the feeling, I didn't feel like, oh, damn, I'm going to be part of the biggest studio ever. And uh, it's, it's just amazing. No, you know, I don't want to discredit them. But I feel like I, now when I think yeah. about it, it's it's like a mature decision when you do things because 
it's necessary to be done, not because it's going to take me up in, you know, to, to brag about that I'm working for this studio and I have their name. Behind. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and, and to me, more important, it wasn't the job title or it wasn't the job itself. It was something else. I want to hear what you, what you say. Opportunity and balance. Working at those larger companies, the thing that I found interesting, like I, I've worked at some really large studios like Naughty Dog and Sony Santa Monica and id. I am incredibly honored to have been a part of those teams. I yeah. learned a ton from them and I would not be the artist I am with not having gone through those. But for example, like if I would have stayed at Sony Santa Monica, I primarily would have just been making God of War for the past 10 years, right? And I was actually like, you see it in the documentary uh, about the last God of War, where I think Raising Kratos with Corey Barlog and all that great documentary, they show glimpses of this canceled project before that God of War was started. And I was uh, on that. Oh. And it was actually very hard to leave because it was so such an exciting time. Like um, at that point, it was really difficult to be a character artist and to do concept art. It was kind of almost like frowned upon a little bit like, oh, you're a character modeler who just never got good at drawing and you just want to sculpt stuff and not do low polys. Not anymore. You know? <laughs> no, right? Not like, anymore. dude, it's such a standard. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, it, it was so funny because um, Patrick Murphy, who's like one of the best leads I've had, he and uh, Stig and Ken Feldman, a lot of the, the upper management there, they gave him the opportunity to kind of between projects at the end of God of War Ascension at the beginning of that project to do some creature designs. And it was a highlight of my career. Uh, I learned a ton from the concept artist there. I learned a ton from the character art team there. I loved it. And mm -hmm. it was such an exciting time. And once again, I think things happen for a reason. You know, I, I left because I wanted to be back in Atlanta and be near family. Um, but what I learned there is like those options and the ability to take a risk. I appreciated that Sony tried that. But like if I would stay at id, you know, like uh, you've got you've got Doom and you've got Doom Eternal or, if, you know, Naughty Dog. It is Uncharted and The Last of Us. Um, at Tripwire you know, I, unfortunately I can't talk about much of what we're doing, but like the amount of things that I've touched in the three and a half years that I've been here is spread such a wide gambit as an artist that it was so refreshing. So not only is it a company that really values work-life balance where we actively avoid crunch, we have a incredibly large amount of not only uh, company holidays, but, um, personal PTO as well. Uh, we have the ability to do freelance and teach and all of these things. It is providing employees with options. And freedom. I think that for me, yeah, there's that freedom and the ability to take risks. Mm -hmm. Because as a smaller company that is self-funded and self-published, we make 100% what we want to make. Um, and we can kind of take a little bit more risks. And I, I, I really enjoy that. Um, you know, we'll make mistakes every now and then, but we learn from them and we try something new. Uh, I, I've, i like I said, I, I feel very fortunate to have the career that I've had, but I, I feel very much at home at Tripwire. You know, actually, one thing you said, you said that uh, you can teach, you can do freelance, you can do all that. This is one of the things I don't like when it, when it comes to contracts, when it comes like mm -hmm. when you're a full-time employee. It, it almost seems like slavery... I'm not saying that they're making you a slave or anyone, but it's, it sounds like it's an unevolved um, area for uh, em employees. Like uh, the time that I spend at home for myself is my time. No one should be allowed to tell me what to do or what they should. Like, I can do whatever I want. That's why I live in Absolutely. America. You know, I, lived, exactly. I came here because of freedom. I want to teach. I want to like make podcasts. I want to do freelance. And they, they call yep. it... Um, 
what is it? Conflict of interest? What? Conflict of interest. It's just uh, my dog. Your dog, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> the, okay. the kids, the kids' friends are trying to stop by, and and it's we have a, a we live in a cul-de-sac, and the kids like to come get the other kids, That's but great. Uh, uh, the the family's at at grandpa's house tonight. Um, but no, I I absolutely agree with you. Like what I do after hours, like hey, we and I appreciate your schedule. Like you worked with me for when I was done with the work day to be able to come and speak with you. Yeah. Work had no problem with it. And I agree like uh, with Tripwire, we just recently finished Maneater. If I was given a call from another game that's like, hey, we're making a game where you're a killer shark and we want concepts for that. That's a pretty direct conflict of interest, and I wouldn't want to cross those streams. Yeah, you don't but, want to work you know, on the same project. Like if someone, exactly. I understand that, right? But if it's a game I completely unrelated, part. why should I even tell you if I'm working on it or not? And exactly. you know that that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, I'll say this, and I think you, you might agree. I don't know. Uh, like for example, you know, one time in a studio, they told me give us review, and I said I'm not going to do that. They said why? I said because you said it's anonymous. And I and they said yes, it is. I said okay, why? Why isn't it like why you're not trying to be me, be myself? What 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 should I? Why should I be scared of giving you a review and hiding my name? So yeah. you are either lying to me; it's not anonymous. You know who is giving the review, or uh, you're just saying this because you want to find out who is giving you bad reviews so you can fire them when the time comes. I could see that um, they don't trust their employees. You know, and it's it's very rare. I can like, see that. Yeah. And the other thing is, like like I said, I mean, uh, the freedom as an artist, an artist needs freedom. We want to. That's why mm -hmm. we are creative because we want to be free to create the stuff, right? Yeah. As long as it doesn't harm your business, why should I um, just become an an slave to the system because you're telling me that I should be this way? You know what I mean? That's something bothered yeah. me for a long time. I'm like, it doesn't make sense. You call this a free country, you call that a free country, you know, Europe is free, democracy. This is not democracy. This is like slavery in a modern way. There is an element of wanting to try slightly different things as well. So like a lot of the freelance that you saw on my Instagram recently was from uh, Godzilla versus King Kong, yeah. uh, which was, you know, like as a kid of the 80s and monsters, like working on uh, Godzilla films, it's been a dream come true. And then even some of those sketches that you see right there, that's from a, a television show for a network called CW called Legacies. I honestly have not seen one episode yet. So I apologize to anyone there, but like there have been one of my best freelance clients, uh, this uh, gentleman named Mark Villalobos, uh, who runs the effects shop for them. And it's so different from what I do for Tripwire that it as as an individual artist and storyteller like i've never felt more satisfied in my life where i have the ability to sketch and communicate mm -hmm. uh and then what i love too is after hours being able to take that creative director hat off and just work just be yourself like just right i mean separate the job from who you are as a person it is because the thing for me with creative direction the, the thing that with the way i work I try not to solve every problem with a creature design. Like when I work as a creative director, I try to approach things from the point of view of the player. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a, it's a big switch in your mindset. Um, you know, like when I'm reviewing stuff at work, it's like, as a player, how does this feel? And as a concept artist, it's more like, am I conveying the information that the director is looking for with this? particular design so it's nice how different it is i i notice it's kind of like when i would sculpt my drawing would would get better and when i would draw my sculpting would get better so it's like these two swords sharpening each other so even on a mental level when i'm working on creative direction there might be in the back of my mind of like if you're the creature designer what information do you need to be successful and then there's times when I'm working as the creature designer where I'm like really able to kind of break down more like what is the director communicating to me here? Like what does he need to be mm -hmm. successful? And am, and am I giving him those things? Yeah, that's teamwork, obviously. And, uh, you know, you mentioned crunch. I just, I just remember this. I, I don't want to mm -hmm. forget about it. Um, 
<laughs> that's another thing, man. You'll like, never forget. Yeah, that. you will never. That's one thing you will never forget. Uh, this is actually mandatory weird. crunch is not fun. It uh, yes, and uh, you know I had this. Uh, I had to deal with it, but at some point, and at some point, I actually resisted because if I am not creative, I am not creative. Crunch for what? Why should I mm-hmm. crunch if I don't need to? It, it feels like a school sometimes, you know, it feels like um, you're in a school and someone is like punishing you if you're not. Yep. It's just weird. Like if we are grown up men, you know, we're people. Yeah. You know, we have families. And and I think um, the problem is we don't have an established uh, system for our industry in general that uh, mm-hmm. doesn't limit because um, it's not it's not the company's fault. Right. It's the bad management. As far as I have seen, it's the bad management. That you're wanting stuff for your own personal uh, interest because uh, you're not ready to open your mind as a manager to see someone else's perspective. You know, like I have seen, for example, uh, art directors giving feedback, um, even though they know they don't know what the answer is and they know the other person knows the answer, but because they are art director or this specific person, not everyone is like that. I, I have seen people like that, the mi- minority, but it's common. And they think because they are art directors, so they have to give feedback. If they don't um, say anything, it's bad for them. And I think, honestly, sometimes silence is better than just um, saying yeah. stuff. Let the team do it. So they don't have I, to I notice with crunch, because even like we really at work pride ourselves at Tripwire, you know, like we are going to try not to crunch. Uh, we're going to maintain our, our kind of core hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like we have, you know... Uh, as directors, we have distinct working time in the day from one to three, which we're really not supposed to schedule meetings and things like that. Um, you know, and and we actually have three options for work now. That's one thing Tripwire did recently due to the pandemic that I think is a big benefit for us. Uh, for example, like I work hybrid. So two days a week, I go into the office and the rest of the time I work from home. And that is primarily so that when the day is over, I can go to my kid's soccer practice or I can make dinner or I can go mow the lawn, right? Things like that. Like I don't have a commute at all. Uh, You can come in and work full-time in-house if you like, but we also have full-time remote, you know, as things in Atlanta have lifted, we weren't like, all right, everyone back to work. I think that's the way to go. The studio. I absolutely agree. Because we have gotten more production or I would say, People are are positively affecting the project just due to that balance of being able to kind of like wake up in your PJs, grab a cup of coffee, and start making stuff. Sometimes I'm creative in the middle of the night as an artist, and that so thing is that's the thing, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. And and it happened to me. Like I solved many of my problems. In the middle of the night, I woke up and I'm like, oh, I know the answer. That's what it is. You're like setting those building blocks yeah. up for the next day. Or if it's writing what I what I what came to my mind, so I don't forget it because you know, when you wake up suddenly you just remember something and then you can't forget it the next day. And the thing is, um I, I, honestly, I think I was having a conversation with a friend of mine today about game industry and the future of the the entertainment industry and so on. And I think if companies uh, or those teams that are actually resisting evolution, they're going to fail. They're going to fail big time. This is part of the evolution, the change, working from home. This is the future. Internet has, I mean, it's growing fast. You know, you can almost do any kind of work with a tablet, especially for you. You're a creative director, right? You don't need to have a big mm-hmm. computer sitting nope. on a computer all the time. You can do it with a tablet just on your couch and or out in the backyard, right? And I yep. think uh, for us, that is something is lacking, you know, constantly sitting in front of the computer and not being outside as a human being. It's destructive, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like limits you to, to grow on certain areas and then you miss the other areas. And I think this is, like I said, working um, remotely or in your case, because you're a creative director, I'm pretty sure it's important to be in the office. But I, don't, I think in the future, that's also, I mean, it's going to change, you know, it will, it, there will be time. To that- me, it already, yeah, it already yeah. has. Cause it's, it's interesting. Like there's multiple things. You have these really large companies with really deep pockets that can be a little more demanding. Tripwire, you know, when you say Georgia to certain people, they might not be as hot hyped up to hop on a plane and move out here. 
but we want to hire really talented people. And we've made some really great hires recently and they've decided to stay remote. And you'll get from certain people who are like, well, how do you guys, you know, foster collaboration and creative conversations that like water cooler talk, right? Where it's like you walk by someone's desk and you see something that they're working on. Um, we share our artwork with each other a lot, you know, like it, it kind of always baffled me when people would ask those types of questions because like some of the best relationships that I have, like old friends from college, you know, the guys that were in my wedding, I haven't seen them in person in a few years, but I talk to them every few nights when we hop online and play Warzone or play Apex. And like the idea of having a digital friendship, like we're, we're meeting and we're talking right yeah. here. We're having a, a deep conversation and like, you're going to have people that are going to tune in and watch this. It's yes. not that uncommon. So for game studios to be like, well, that creative collaboration can only happen in person. There were buddies that were invited to weddings that only met each other beforehand playing games. So it's like if a, a deep seated friendship can happen over, you know, a 13 year old yelling expletives at us as we played Battlefield, I'm sure we can make some cool video games yeah, in the process yeah. digitally def as well. Def definitely. And uh, again, as, as I said, it's evolution. You can't stand in the way of evolution. When things um, have to change, it will change regardless of what they want. And, you know, there is actually data that shows every 20 years, uh, when yes. people grow 18 and 20, they bring a new change. Like in our gener mm -hmm. generation, we, we, as you said, like we are the 80s kids. We had no phones and then cell phones, cell phones came out and then internet came out. I remember I was the first time like I watched TV, it was a black and white TV. You know, even mm -hmm. though it wasn't common in US, but where I lived in Iran, it was normal. And then we, we I had access to cell phones later than you guys. Internet, I actually had access to dial up same time as US back in 2000. I had, um, it wasn't booming, right? It was dot com bubble, dot com booming, and yep. companies came up with a dot com and then the bubble burst and everything back to normal. But n the thing is, we are in transition, right? The generation, how do I say, like we came, we are kind of coming from a stone age to internet age. You know what I mean? Everything is changing. Yeah. And a new kid, Dude, look that, at, like your like, girl. Yeah, exactly. Everything's Everything. at your fingertips. Exactly. Right? Like right here. Like it's amazing the amount of work that you can get done with just this. Yeah, you can change. Right? You can make money. You can do everything. And here's the mm -hmm. thing. You have two kids. Do you think they understand how life was before internet? They can't. No. It's impossible, right? No way. So so this is the part. I think the, um, you know, I heard some companies are asking people to go back in. I think the reason is because they're from the older generation, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, and then min millennials are changing the way we work and we live, and the next generation cannot accept that it, it has to go through. And there is there is a there is actually scientific data that every year, every eighty years, there's a big change, there's a big shift. There is because That's the right. older generation, you know, Warren Buffett and everyone, they're going to die eventually yep. after their uh, amazing life or whatever, and then now it's time to move to the next generation. You know, and those yeah. who are in between, they're getting sacrificed. We are the one in between. <laughs> Somehow, I think it's very well. I think it's very important for us to be aware of the change. And and for me, it was. I forget the exact year I moved out to LA, but I remember Stan Winston oh. died months earlier, before I came out there. And I remember that kind of signifying a change where I was like really breaking down as I was like driving cross country with my fiance and like my dad and like a little U-Haul uh -huh. of you're not doing makeup effects. You're working on a computer. Stan Winston is dead. This is this has changed. And I remember even like hearing, you know, later in life about like his thoughts on Jurassic Park when, you know, ILM did that test of the T-Rex. Wow. And just like we have to adapt. And I always thought like how, you know, CG and, you know, characters like the T-Rex and Gollum, you know, like you wouldn't imagine seeing those practical now. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. you, you they exist as digital characters and we fully accept them. I've always had in the back of my mind, like, what is the thing that's going to change us in games and storytelling? That's going to be the switch. Because I remember. You know, and there's like little things like we're a little too young to realize it. But like, I remember working with certain guys 
who were working as character artists before ZBrush came out, before like character art was even a job. They were like mm -hmm. 3D artists. You were modeling cars, you were modeling people, this and that. Like, dude, like you look at old school Kratos, like his arms are just like cylinders and spheres smashed into each other. And it's like all, yeah. you know, rigid binding stuff, right? Yep. It's funny how, like, I'll, I'll never forget, uh, there was an artist, I think he's an art director now, I haven't talked to him in years, uh, Young Choi, I worked with him at um, Sony Santa Monica, really talented character guy, and he'd been around the block for a while, and I remember talking to him out of ZBrush, because uh, the character art team at Sony Santa Monica was one of the first teams to get a hold of Dynamesh. And we were just like blown away. We were like, because we were doing these lunch crunches, which funny, you want to talk like that's 10 years ago is when we were doing those Sony Santa Monica lunch crunches mm -hmm. where uh, this another artist, James Van and Bogart, he kind of brought them in from they were doing them at ArenaNet. And the guys at Sony, we just really got into them and we were loving it. And we got to do a bunch of ZBrush beta testing and stuff like that. And Young brought up he was like i never forgot when zebra first came out like he basically thought it was going to be a fad because he was like we're doing one program one whole program to make one map like i'm going to do this whole process to make a normal map you're out of your wow. mind wow that's crazy and now look how where most character artists are probably spending a good what 80 or 90 percent so how old was this guy at the time ZBrush? I would have to say young might be if he's hearing this he's probably rolling his eyes at me now he looks young but maybe he's 10 years older than me maybe okay. like i'm so 38 the reason maybe I'm not asking 10 is years maybe maybe five or six maybe five or six so the reason i'm asking that makes a makes a difference right i was a late i was a late bloomer as well with cg like i didn't start to like my mid 20s i think i i think i started when i was I actually started in the year 2001, but it wasn't a start. I just got familiar with it, right? And then seriously, okay. I, I got more involved into making some stuff at 2003. So before okay. that, I was just playing around, making some work here and there and so on. The reason I asked how old was he, no offense to him. Uh, I'm sure he's a nice guy because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, as, as everyone is. He had been, he, I think he got an early start and he had been around. And like I said, I was very much a late bloomer because once again, this whole CG thing was like the backup plan in case rubber monsters, you know, didn't exist. Uh, yeah. So um, this is the thing that makes a difference, right? You said he's saying like this one software to make a map. No, it doesn't make sense. Right. When ZBrush yeah. came out, I was, I was ZBrush 2, right? 17, 18, something yep. like that. That was the time I said, this is the Zip, Zip software I should use. I was very excited. I said, I remember yeah. very well, too, I was talk, having a conversation with my friend on the phone. There was no smartphone at the time. And I was like, this is it. This is what I should learn. I don't want to do any of these polygon modeling and, you know. Dude, a hundred. I will never. <laughs> do you remember the first moment you used ZBrush? Yes. Yes. Very like, much. Like, it's, it's funny. I remember, like, my first date with my wife. I remember like the day my kids were born and then like <laughs> not to, like they're not here right now. So I guess I can get away with saying it, but I distinctly remember like there was a few, I remember the first time I made like my first latex Halloween mask, like being able to like pour latex in a mold of a sculpture I did fun, yeah. and pull it out and have like a copy, like a rubber mask that I made. I was like, Oh my God. And on that same level, I'll never forget going to a friend's house after school uh and he had zbrush and i was i i'm not a technical guy at all i really struggle with a lot of technical stuff i'm as technical as i need to be but i mean like uh dude the guys at id software can can laugh it up and they were very helpful but like the ability for me to make a normal map in game like i always messed up one bit of text or a space <laughs> extra here or there or putting that command in like i i'm not the best at trying things the first time and mastering them like even with drawing like drawing monsters i go through quite a few bad drawings to land at some good drawings um and that's just something i've had to learn to accept like my younger brother he's like a tall skinny good looking version of me and like everything he does in life <laughs> he does it once and he's like great at it like he was like i'm gonna do stand-up did stand-up awesome at it he's the type of guy that like i remember as a kid he'd be like skateboarding i'm gonna learn skateboarding do it awesome at it i'm sure he could literally start concept art and be good at it but wow. I, I was always the opposite and um i'll never forget like we were doing like nerves modeling at school and i was like losing my mind i was like oh my god like what is this thing I, or like I, we we 
we had some very good professors at our institute, but we also had some some instructors that definitely were not kind of on the top of their game. And I'll never forget, like we had to model like a tank out of one cube. Yeah, so every modeling. shape that we did, <laughs> dude, it was like you were cutting, inserting edge loops, extruding. Like I'll never forget, like getting to a point, like seeing someone like make a gun out of like multiple objects. I was like, that, you could do that. I didn't, I didn't know. Like I always felt like there were rules that like weren't, you couldn't. Yeah. Break. Yeah. Because it was pretty new, right? There, there was, it some was rules. so new. You're like, I did and it's yeah. on a computer. Cause like it, and two for our age, like I grew up, you know, like with like a uh, comic books and clay, you know, yeah. like everything was very tangible and like, yeah, it's clay. If you drop it, you, you do it again with a computer. I was like always afraid of like breaking something. But when I got a hold of ZBrush, I was like, oh my God, like this is, it's just digital clay. Like I can't really break this. I can just kind of mush stuff around. Sometimes and... I, you know, I just say, because the other day I was talking on this um, YouTube channel for the, for Brazilian guys. Uh, one thing I said, I said, I don't know how much luck is involved in, in my life as an example. And I think you, you, you can probably relate to that. I always ask, what if ZBrush didn't exist? What would happen? Oh, where would dude, I, where I would, would be I like be? homeless or something. <laughs> yeah. I don't, it, it's funny. I have this like super old ratty ZBrush t-shirt that we were given from beta testing, like ZBrush 3.1, right? And every time that I put, there's a few scenarios that it, it kind of hits me. I don't, since I'm not producing as much work in ZBrush these days, the ability to beta test or go to SIG, like, dude, I would, I would go and do SIGGRAPH demonstrations. Remember like that was a thing like yeah. going to SIGGRAPH, right? Yeah. Um, but like I, they, they would be so kind, like uh, Jaime and Paul and O'Fair and those guys. And they really took care of us. And dude, I almost worked there at one point i almost wow. when i left sony santa monica i almost worked at pixelogic yeah, right. and yeah. those guys were so nice like my wife's grandfather would mow the lawn in a zbrush hat and i remember like seeing this ratty old zbrush shirt and seeing my wife's grandfather wearing a zbrush hat and being like you owe a lot to this program yeah, like, ZBrush actually changed lives. The first guy that actually changed a lot of lives is Alex Alvarez. He doesn't know it probably. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Everywhere. A hundred percent agree with that. I started yeah. with his videos. Mm-hmm. Nomen, I remember because like that, like we're at the age where you would get the physical DVDs, right? Like there wasn't yes, streaming. Yes, that's service. what I'm talking like, about. Yeah. All of those things, like Ian McKegg's storytelling and like his drawings, yeah. like these things that I didn't really know kind of existed. Like you would get an art of the Lord of the Rings book and you would kind of get a glimpse into Weta Workshop or something like that. But the Nomen DVDs were like, oh, Everything. this is how I do that. It was it it was like a magician revealing all his tricks. Yep. Um, yeah. And I, I actually, maybe a few months ago, I did a stream with like one of my best friends is, I believe he's the chief creative officer for Nomen and him and Alex are really good friends. Uh, Josh Herman, Alex, and I did like a, um, little art jam one night and mm. it was insanely intimidating working next to him. Cause it's just like, I think I did a doodle of this, like a little cartoony, like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And he had like a whole friggin' scene where he was like sculpting multiple characters and rendering this out and rendering that out. And I was just like, this, this dude still Alex, is producing content. Yeah, he, yeah. I don't, I don't get the, I don't understand how he's doing all the things at the same time. He's, he must be super uh, smart. <laughs> You know, he's definitely a very smart guy. And I think he's another really good example of just doing what you want to do. Like if something has your interest and something's caught your attention, focus on it and do it. Like I always tell that to students. Like I, I do not like seeing portfolios that it's like, here's two characters, here's a car and here's an environment. Cause for me as an employer and like a director or as a lead at really anyone that's kind of in that interview process, it's like, okay, you, you, even if you have some really good models here, I'm confused on what do you want to do? Like, do you want to be yeah. a character artist? Do you want to be an environment artist? Let, let me ask you something about the interview. You know, I interviewed a lot of people myself, mm -hmm. not the podcast, right? I interviewed a lot of people at work mm -hmm. to, to hire people. And, uh, 
I don't want to say I was different, but I always tried to be disruptive when I interviewed people. I didn't take the, the traditional way of what, where do you want to be in five years? You know, all the yeah. questions that we know they ask and everyone just duplicating it. And uh, uh, I can say, actually, every, every hire I did, I was successful at it. Like, it's really good artists, good people, you know. Um, and uh, so here's what I want to ask you. Do you think, because I, I said this once, I said, interview, no offense to people or anything. I'm just like trying to express what I feel sometimes based on the data and the way that some people interview, some companies interview. You know, majority of the time, because it became, it, it's kind of like, the old traditional way of interviewing, right? Mm-hmm. And it hasn't evolved much uh, until recently. It's changing now. People yep. don't just focus on resume and things like that. So, you know, I said this all the time. Uh, once to my, my friend, I said, interview basically is a process because it hasn't evolved enough. You go to, a, to an interview, you prepare your question, you talk to the recruiter, you know what they're going to ask you. They know what you're going to answer and if the questions and answers match, they will hire you, regardless of your, um, you know, what you are as a person for real or how experienced yeah. you are, right? And it fails many, many times. Like you, you can see, in, I'm pretty sure you, you have seen people get hired and they don't know what to do. Not that they are bad. They're just in the wrong position at the wrong time. Mm-hmm. And that's not their interest. They get depressed. It's bad, right? And, yeah. and I found that it's because of that. It's because uh, you go to an interview and you you know what they're going to answer you, so you're going to tell them what they want you, what what they what you know they want you to say in order to get hired, right? Yeah. And you put yourself in a agree. trap. So I want to hear your thoughts uh, on that, you know, because I think that's that's damaging, yeah. and that's also put puts a lot of pressure on artists and in general game de- developers, right? Because if I need a job and if I can, I, I need to be honest. I'm going to this interview. I need this job. I can't do it, but I'm not enjoying it. But, I, but if I have to do my best, I'll do my best to do it for you guys to make you guys happy because I need this job. How long am I going to stay here? Maybe two years, maybe three years. Maybe things will change. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do in five years. You know what I mean? The honesty, yeah. I think that's what's missing, to be honest. I think there's honesty from both sides too, yes. right? Yes. Where at, if having the tables turn where I'm I'm hiring more people and, you know, obviously the thing that's changed for me is I've noticed at, uh tripwire as creative director i'm interviewing people but i'm also trying to highlight some of the things that we are working on so with our company you know we'll have you sign an nda because as we are in the beginning of something unannounced and new you have certain people that are like if you're expecting me to come there and spend x amount of years of my life working on something i want to know what i'm working on so i do a little bit of a sales pitch right And I make sure that this is someone that we're hiring. Not only are I'm trying to gauge their level of excitement. Is this something that they're going to feel passionate about and want to come to work to and contribute to? And they're not just looking for a paycheck, right? So that's the honesty that I'm looking for. But when I would interview myself, it was, am I going to get the things from this company that are some of the things that like we talked about earlier, like I really want to become a better monster maker. I want to become a better storyteller. And how do I do that with games? And how do I do that at this company? What is my contribution going to be? Uh, Yeah, I want to work on really cool projects, but are they going to take care of me as well? Not only financially, but is there X amount of vacation and PTO days? Are benefits paid for? What is the turnover rate of this company? You know, like looking at things like that and you can tell in an interview pretty early on if if the parties are both being honest with one another. Yeah, it's pretty especially now because we're all more experienced, right? It's like 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 20 years ago where you go, you go to an interview with a VFX company. You never worked in the industry. Now we have experience. Now we all have almost half of the industry. They have 10, 20 years of experience. Right. And, you know, yeah. From my experience, uh, what I'm seeing is uh, the cliche questions and answers. That's kind of like it has to go away. And I feel like it's it's changing now because of the growth of the tech and education and internet and all, and all that. Other things are making more sense. You know, no one really cares about the showreel anymore. They just want to know more. About no, it. it's, it's changed. It's evolving. So that's part of when, the evolution. When was the last time you showed work for an interview? Because that's one thing ne- I found oh, really interesting. A long time ago, maybe... Uh, I think it was five years ago last time. 
Yeah. And I think that's one thing for students to realize that there is an element of like, yes, it is hard to break in the industry and, and you need to show this quality level. But once you ship that first title, yeah. it literally is like, I like I did not apply to a job since Sony Santa Monica. I, uh, Meaning yeah, that I like it would be like uh, we would be talking to a friend and they'd yes. be like, oh, there's an opening. Do you want to come here? Exactly. Or, hey, I, I'm hiring this and oh, I got a buddy and oh, we'll have someone give you a call. Like, I don't know a lot about professional sports, obviously, uh, <laughs> but no. it is. It's very interesting to me, the similarities of like professional sports and like trading players. Mm -hmm. Like I'll never forget at the end of uh, Doom 2016, a bunch of the character artists were approached by, I want to say it was like Gorilla or something like that. Or, oh, it was Rocksteady. I think Rocksteady contacted quite a few of the, the artists that worked on it. And it was so funny because at that time, a bunch of us were playing rugby like during lunch out in front of the studio. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in the recruitment package, they talked about how there was like a rugby time or, or something like that, or the company, there was like a company rugby team. And we we're just like, Oh my God, did they like spy on us? Like, how do they know we're playing rugby? What's going on here? So it's, <laughs> it's interesting. And I, I do think artists still need that element uh, like that's something that I've talked about with Tripwire before, and, and they've done a pretty good job at it of making people feel special and welcome when they come to the team. Yeah. You know, like a Tripwire, when you come, we not only want you to contribute to our games, but we want you to stay for a long time. Like we don't want a lot of turnover at Tripwire. Yeah, but you know, We're here's a the thing: company and we want to stay small. That, that's that's very good, right? But the the thing is. Uh... You can never know the future. Like when they ask me, you can. What, yeah, what do you want to nope. do five years from now? I don't know. I want to have. Uh, I want to have ten million, twenty million dollars, and be a, on the beach and just <laughs> have fun. That's yeah. I mean, yeah. Why what, not? Are, what are these NFT who, things? Who, I just want to get really into <laughs> yeah. that. Who doesn't want that? I right? just want more of that. You know, yep. it's weird because I'll tell you two examples that are really funny. One time in an interview, someone asked me, "What would you do if you were rich?" I'm like. Are you kidding me? Are you, for real? You're asking me that question? And I, and I asked, I said, do you want, it, you want an honest answer? And yeah. I said, I wouldn't apply here. I wouldn't apply here. Yeah. I, and he said, what would Did you do? Did they give you a job offer? He didn't, but the owner of the company okay. knew me and he gave me the offer. He said, ignore that That's guy. Interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hire yeah. you. <laughs> okay. But that, said, that honesty, I'm sure, was appreciated. Yeah, not Maybe this guy. Maybe not to the other not guy, to him, but the because, owner. Yeah, because his ego was damaged. And I told him, do, if yes. you want me to be honest, if I was rich enough, I would probably have my own studio, or I would be on the beach yeah. and drink some, you know, some beer and do some. I would be right there you with know. you. Yeah, and have fun with my wife, with with my family. That maybe yeah. that, or maybe I would, I would, I don't know, work more and become an astronaut, like have enough money to travel to space. <laughs> that I don't know. I'm not rich yet, so how can you ask yeah. me that question? So this guy was, you know, was upset. Another time I went to an interview, the moment I entered the office, I was like, damn, this is not the, the place. I was actually looking for the time to finish so I can leave. Okay. Dude, those <laughs> interviews and, and, and being on both sides of those, whether you're the employer and you're interviewing someone. And <laughs> it's interesting how fast sometimes you can be like, oh, this isn't working. Yes. We've got to you, mean, you, you know up. it for the first. Or on the, yeah. Or on the <laughs> other side where you, yeah. you literally like walk in a room and say, I'll never forget one interview <laughs> I did in LA in a fex shop. And I sat down and immediately it was just like, this is not, not going to be a good use of time. But I don't want to be rude. So no, no, yeah. I, and you, you don't want to like ditch the... I'll never forget. I had a buddy say he was an animator and he got a job at a company and he worked for like maybe a week and i think that friday like every day it was just re-securing his fear that this is not the place he needs to be that on friday he was just like you know what guys i'm out of here don't even worry about the check i appreciate the time i'm gonna go do something else wow and i was just like dude i and there's another story that i heard of another guy uh, I, I won't name any names, but I, I heard this individual worked at a pretty big effect shop. They were working on these big movies, doing what you always imagined, like kind of like we were talking about me at General Giant. You know, you're doing this, you're doing that, and then you get pulled to do something that's kind of more not what you imagined. And this artist was getting to do these these designs and sculptures for these big movies. And then when the movies were over and it was in between, he was just like, I'm going to go home now. 
bye. And they're like, well, don't you want to stay and do this other stuff? And he was just like, no. Like, he was just super honest. He was like, I don't want to do that work. Yeah. And it's funny. I think a lot of people, maybe when you're in your the beginning of your career, you'd be like, whoa, like he said no to them. That's really out of line. That's unprofessional. There's an element of honesty there, though, that I think is great, right? But like some people not don't only to him it. as an individual. You know, you know what's funny? One time, uh, this this company that I'm telling you, I don't want to name. I went in and I was like, no, mm -hmm. no. Immediately, I called my wife. Messaged me and she she was like, how do you feel? And I'm like. I'm in the lobby and it's a no already. So I'm just going to go yeah. up there, talk to them for the whole day because I'm here. But no, I don't want it. It was in LA. And yeah. uh, so in the interview, one of them asked me, so where do you work? I'm like, here. How long have you been there? Two years. So why you're living? I said, because you guys reached out to me. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So you, you probably need to make up your mind, you know, so... Uh, you guys, your recruiter reached out to me, explained the situation. One thing I've taken a lot of joy in at uh, Tripwire, one of the things that we've invested in for um, kind of upper management is we're going through this emotional intelligence training. Mm, and important. dude, that is the first day where we started this just before the pandemic, I believe. And I'll never forget the first day, like sitting in a room with all the other directors, kind of knights of the round table type thing. And people are introducing themselves. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm the creative director. Hi, I'm so-and-so. They get to one guy. He's like, I, I'm so-and-so. And I am, you know, basically like he's the therapist. Wow. And I just remember like texting my wife, like in my pocket, like, oh my God, this just got real. Like there's a therapist here. <laughs> I thought we, I thought we were going to be like singing Kumbaya and doing trust falls and stuff like that. Right. <laughs> it is one of the best elements of continued education that i've had at this point in my career would i have appreciated as much when i was like 27 definitely not but that has become a big part of our interviewing process where like if we work with each other i'm going to see you more during the day than i'm going to see my wife and kids yeah we're going to agree on things we're going to disagree on things. How are we going to react to one another, right? How are we going to learn to This really is exactly the problem that I have. Conflict resolution, right? Yep. When yep. like what is healthy conflict? Cuz it's okay to disagree. It's fine to have conflict, but as long as you don't disrespect. Yes. At work, I had this once I had this um situation with the manager, everything had to be his way or or you know, he would just go around and talk bad about me or, you know, weird, weird reactions. And then once I, I told him, what, what's wrong with you? Why are you not telling me face to face? And he's, he said, I'm scared of you. I'm like, what did I do to be, I mean, I'm just honest with you. Yep. If you can't take honesty, then yep. we shouldn't work together. Why are yep. you scared of me? I never it, disrespected you, you know? <laughs> it's, it's the beard. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> No. So I actually, dude, in all jokingness, I, so I, I shaved my beard recently. It definitely was not as glorious as yours, but I had a, a bigger, beard. I noticed when I had a beard, people responded to me differently. I don't know if yeah, you remember different. a time without your beard, but like there would be times that like with me with a beard, it's like permanent resting bitch face. Like you have a beautiful <laughs> smile, but like, I would notice like my kids, if I, if I tried to like, Hey, just, Hey, I need you to listen with a beard. The response is totally different than when I have, uh, I notice at my age, the reason I even have some facial hair is to communicate to people where my, my neck ends and my head begins. Cause when it's just freshly shaved, it's just like a, <laughs> a thumb with eyes. And this is actually good because, uh, it gets, gets cold here. So it's, it's protective, you know, it makes me warm. You're, in winter. That's, <laughs> that's smart. That's smart. Move, but yeah, the, but, it's funny though, because it, it, when I started, I've been a creative director now for two years, so I'm, I'm relatively new and I'm learning a lot about myself and leadership. And uh, when I first started, I, I didn't know what I was doing. There are parts I still don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm figuring it out and Tripwire is training me and I'm learning. And um, one of the things is my dad is pretty old school, right? I played a lot of team sports growing up. So when coach or dad said jump, you asked how high. Boom, yes. Right. Yes. And it really caught me off guard where like there'd be certain artists that I'm like, hey, we're going to do this or just certain devs. And they're like, cool. Got it. Yeah, Let's yeah. go. They understood. It really rattled me at first when I'd be like, hey, guys, we're going to do this. And someone's like, why? No, no. 
Yes. Yeah. Or like, yeah. We, and that was the ultimate is when someone was like, no, I don't think we should do that. And you're just like, man, I could never imagine telling yeah. <laughs> the boss. No, but the more that I've taken this emotional intelligence training and I've, I've gone, the thing that's interesting is your career changes where I might've spent X amount of hours learning how to sculpt hands or how to use marvelous designer. I'm now investing that time in what can I do to be a better storyteller? What can I do to be a better leader? What can I do to be a better writer? You know, like just what are these, what are the tools that I'm using the most and how can I hone them? And um, the emotion intelligence training that they're providing us with, the things that would previously maybe have gotten me a little hot under the collar or, you know, kind of raise my blood pressure. I just understand it's part of, development now and and human interaction and and healthy conflict and you know thinking about and it sounds so simple but like the thing that i might tell you to give you the information that you need to be successful might be completely different than the character artist right next to you yeah you yeah know? that's just so knowing how to talk people exactly understanding each individual and uh you know i had that uh you know talking to people at, at work i think Ninety uh, percent of the time, there's always ten percent error. Uh, I don't want to be like mm -hmm. I don't want to say uh, I was the best or whatever. I was working this this because usually we are biased. You know, they they did a study that shows uh, people always take more credit than they deserve, more than they they did. You know, so they think they did yeah. more than they they got credited. So we always take our own side, right? I'm I'm right, you're wrong. I'm better, you're not good. I'm I'm right all the time, and I'm the more respectful person and so on but i always try to, to be respectful and one of the things I, I i always have is like i'm looking at the perspective of the other person you know where is this person coming from what is his culture how, how many what are the things that he had to go through to come this far or you know to work mm -hmm. in this studio or that studio or you know when you put all the, all of those uh, things in mind kind of you, you can understand the perspective of the person because i had the um, this these situations a um, um, couple of times when I was managing that I said something and the artist is like uh, no why should we do it that way uh, and I realized okay so how would I react if my manager told me this maybe I should uh, you know explain why and then give him my perspective and let him try his perspective you know yeah. and 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 it worked and it worked. But I had to deal one time. I had to deal with this manager. No matter what I said, man, <laughs> I'm always wrong. Even though the result speaks for itself, I'm always wrong. That's that was the outcome. <laughs> the thing that I've noticed that helps me there is knowing a person's emotional needs, and that's yep. tough, right? Because you don't want to come up to someone immediately, meet them, and be like, "Hi, I'm Brian Wanya." I need affection, acceptance, and approval, right? Like these yeah, are the things yeah. that will be successful. But like we did that with our director group. I those so for me, those are my things. And and what affection even means, I think just, you know, the affection I get from my family is obviously very different than the affection that I want from coworkers or online, right? Yeah. But it's that that dopamine hit of if you look at like affection and appreciation and acceptance, they're kind of very related to one another. It's that dopamine hit of you posting a piece of artwork and and someone saying they're inspired by it or someone doing a piece of fan art or someone just even hitting that like button for you, right? Yep. Like there's this element of people like my artwork, right? Or or people like this this thing that I did. And, and for me, that kind of is one of my emotional needs that I enjoy. And I noticed working with the other directors, like respect, right? Like that was one of the huge emotional needs and, and sharing that respect with people and being in a leadership position, it's one thing. And I think it's, it's super important, but just as a person now, like trying to understand what people's emotional needs are, right? Like if I'm communicating to my kid and she's struggling, what emotional needs are not being fulfilled for her? You know, does she, is it, is it a form of uh, attention? that she needs? Is it a form of approval? And then trying to then fill those emotional needs makes that interaction way more enjoyable for all parties, right? Yes. Yep. And I think that's the hardest part is until you have that conversation with someone, you're kind of assuming what they are. And I, I don't know the answers to a lot of this, right? It's like I'm very different. much- 
Yeah, different learning. personalities. It's just weird. Um, no, you're right. I mean, um, I think I think for the studios, it's, uh, this is the transition. I, I almost mm-hmm. think like the, the whole game industry is in a... Uh, I don't want to go deep into it because that's a, that's a big topic, but I feel like we can talk about it if you want, but I feel like we are at a certain peak in the industry because the old generation, those who actually invented consoles, the first games and all that, they are actually on a higher position, but they're getting pushed out of the market because the new generation wants something different. The new generation wants wants to work in a different way. The new generation doesn't want to be a slave, doesn't want to be limited uh, under freedom, how many companies they want to work for, where do they want to work for, right? So all of these yeah. changes or the way games are made, right? I mean, we can see a lot of games are turning into gambling um, station, basically, instead of, you know, being more, uh, how do I say, like, educational or uh, I don't know like I, I guess everyone is kind of like the, the old generation they're stuck in time they don't want to shift but the new generation says something different they want to be like free and do more and uh, like a different style completely right different style of management different style, style of games and so on so I feel like we are in that phase of change in the overall industry um mm-hmm. And I feel like I we're at the peak, you know, in, in the current uh, state of the mind of this whole industry. In general, the pandemic has changed things, some for the negative, right? There was a yeah. lot of scary stuff that happened, uh, but a lot for uh, the positive as well. So, like, one thing for me with, like, uh, doing freelance and things like that, uh, or Tripwire adopting three different types of uh, work ways, you know, or, or ways to work at Tripwire to really cater to them. I remember leaving LA, LA and fearing out of sight, out of mind. And mm. there were points of really big projects that I had to pass on, whether I was at uh, high res or at id, there was like these, you know, opportunities to work on Marvel movies or, you know, these, these other projects that came through that I, I would have killed for at one point. And now I've never been busier in my life from tripwire to the freelance that I do because of the pandemic, all of a sudden everyone had to work remotely. And right? you don't have to worry. So, like you can say, today I want to work at home, guys. I'll see you tomorrow. And before, no one has any problem with exactly. it. Exactly. Before was like, oh, okay. And then behind on your back, there was there's a chance that someone would be like, why is this guy working from home? And mm-hmm. maybe your manager's like, oh, you're working. I heard that. Like uh, one time I was finishing my work all the time. This is actually, I don't want to name the studio, but I left it and I'm, uh, you know, uh, it, it wasn't the best experience I had, you know. Every experience is a great experience, by the way. Like you just learn, yeah. you know what you want. It takes you closer to your yeah. purpose. But sometimes it doesn't match with uh, the things that you have in mind. And then you grow in the studio and you, you realize, no, this is not this is not exactly what I expected, right? And then you move on. So um, like one of the things I heard was like, oh, you worked at home too much. How many times? Six times. Okay. Six <laughs> times in 365 days. Are you serious right now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so what? I mean, I finished the work. And everything. Yeah. You know, Are you happy with the work that I contributed? Yeah, they did, were happy. Did I do the things that I asked? You know what's funny? They said, they said, oh, work is great. We never complained about that. I'm like, okay, so I guess I'm doing my job. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know what I mean? This is like, it's like as if someone's ego is on the line. They're not controlling the way they want to control and they want to change it. You know what I mean? Um, I I think too. It's like one of the things that we kind of hit on before we started recording is like we were talking about you know like just the age we're at and your yeah. interests. Yes, it's funny how things change because that's the thing is like we've gotten to a point where I I, I by no means feel like I've mastered my craft, but there is an element of like wanting to try new things, yes. whether that's creative direction at work, being given that opportunity and wanting to take that and run with it. Um, I'm really into yard work now, right? Like you were so, talking about, you're really into uh, woodworking and things like that, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm and, into yard work too. Music, you know, yeah. doing these interviews. I'm not making a character now, but I'm having a lot of fun right now talking to you. I Well, man, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm, I'm enjoying this as well. That's I great. think there's a, a point in your career that you want to try. And maybe it's not even your career. 
like maybe it's your age. Right. Like we were talking about yeah, like my, my dad, right? Like my dad around a similar age, probably early forties. Right. So we're, we're getting there soon. He <laughs> like, he was like begging to be fired because he just wanted to stay at home and woodwork. Right. Wow. And uh, you know, for me, like one of the big factors of coming to tripwire was we have an exceptional amount of PTO. And I was always really nervous by companies that had unlimited PTO because I always felt like that was this landmine. Like if I took it and I used it, would certain team members who might not have kids or might not vacation as much, would that hold that against me? So, but Tripwire, we have, uh, you know, almost every single month we have at least one long weekend. And then we also have a good bit of, you know, uh, sick days and PTO days and things like that. And, um, you know, like for example, we were off yesterday there's the studio is a ghost town right now because everyone wanted to take that long weekend and yeah. extend it into even longer. And I really enjoy that. I love that people have that freedom to do that. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, working from home, it provides the opportunities like today you and I could do this. Yep. I finished work. I brushed my teeth, changed my shirt and we're doing this, you know, yeah. or tomorrow. Yeah. We got a storm coming in. I got to get down some fertilizer. That's oh, the that's the age yeah. where I was about to say where like <laughs> you get excited. I was nervous about Fourth of July because the amount of fertilizer I put on my yard and the amount of fireworks that were going off nearby. I was like, God, <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> I don't know about fireworks, but I know the guy on the other side of the cul-de-sac. Like we might be setting ourselves up for a, a big show here. Yeah. Um. And 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 it's nice being able to get to that age and just try different things. I always envied artists that did this well beforehand. Uh, one of my best friends in the industry, dude, just in life, uh, character artist. Um, actually, I believe Kayton's an art director now, Kayton Calloway. I worked with Kayton at Sony Santa Monica. And he came in and he did his job and he did a great job. And then he raised beautiful kids, has an awesome marriage. Like the dude just always seemed to have balance on life. And it was amazing. And he would do personal artwork. Um, he would work out. Like he just, I always looked up to Kate and, and I still do. Like I always text him or, you know, I, I, I would say, I always text him, but just recently I texted him for some advice where, you mm. know, I needed some help with, with balance. And, um, one, it's important to have friends like that, you know, I think it's important to have friends in the industry that you can talk to, to get an inside perspective. But then I would also say it's very important to have friends outside of the industry yeah. to help kind of put things in perspective for you yep. because the bubble that we live in as artists working in the entertainment industry it feels like it's the end all be all, it's right? Huge. Like it is everything, yep. right? Yep. But when you look at it in the grand scheme of life, it's important what we're doing. But it's nothing, honestly. Where, do, it's, where does it fit in the grand scheme of everything? It's, the reality is this. People have to accept the reality, right? The reality is it's just, it is just entertainment, right? And if it doesn't this exist... Is by if, sorry, yeah. if it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. Life goes on. It's not that essence of life. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not, it's I'll not, never uh, forget. We're okay, not curing cancer, I think, is like exactly, a common. Exactly. You exactly. know, like, right. Yeah. And I was excited to do this because, like, I've gotten to the point where I, I love talking to brand new college students. There is this excitement that is infectious. Like they just want to gobble everything up. And there's, I remember being that age, right. Where you're yeah, just like, too. I want to master these programs and, and push my skill set and get a job in this industry. And it's nice teaching those groups because it kind of reinvigorates and one lets me know how fortunate I am to be where I'm at. And granted there was hard work and stuff involved, but yep. there's definitely a stroke of luck in there as well. Right. Yes. You know, um, we, we always underestimate the luck because we want to be like, yeah, we did it ourselves. But the reality, like I said, yeah. if ZBrush didn't exist or if I didn't get that offer or if I did, didn't get that freelance job, it would be different. I, I can, I can literally trace back 
every job to like, oh, I got this job because I worked with this person here and I knew that person who was friends with this person. Like it all is this connecting thing. And I think a lot of times that uh, example or analogy, if you will, or story can and can kind of like give some certain students the wrong message. But like, no, we all start off like my dad wasn't the president of Nintendo or anything like that. And I was given the job like I had to go out of my way, you know, for me, the very first thing, the way it happened uh, was I used to build a haunted house in high school in my mom's backyard. She would let me tear apart her yard and we would have everyone from the theater nerds to the football jocks running around in costumes in the backyard. And I'll never forget. She's like, this is too much. We literally have like hundreds of people coming through the backyard. We're tearing the place apart. Like the, the neighborhood cop can only help so much. You got to go get a job at like a real haunted house. And I was fortunate enough. And the first bit of luck I ever had was in Atlanta. There is a haunted house called Netherworld Haunted House. And it's one of the top haunted houses in the U.S. Uh, Fearworld.com, I think, is the website. Check it out. Mm. All of the guys that work there used to work on movies. So I went and I got a job there. And that literally snowballed because that's how I met Bill and got to do makeup effects. That's how I then got out to L.A. Like that was the spark. Yeah, dude, I literally just shared this on Instagram, like now hiring all positions. When I was 18 years old, I got a job at this haunted house. They were the first company to professionally pay me to not only be a monster, but make Mm. monsters. You know, I Ben Armstrong and Billy Messina, the guys that own this haunted house. I literally owe everything to them. So this was that first bit of not only luck, but kind of like going out of my way to find that job like that. It was the first kind of like, you know, classic, like uh, what is that? A cold call, I guess you could call it where it's just like, I went to the haunted house and I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. This is what I want to do. And I just came right around to the ticket booth. And I was like, where do I apply? And I was working there the next night, you know? Wow. And from there, it just snowballed. Yeah, that's it. The thing, it, it snowballs, right? And uh, yeah, it was the same for me. Like, if I, 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 maybe one day I should make a video about my my uh, process. Because, Absolutely, I think people you know, would love to hear that. Probably, yeah. But, Dude, you're uh, doing just, awesome stuff. I love your show. <laughs> and I love your work. You. This is great, man. It, it's just you know, um, the the part that makes more like I actually wonder sometimes when I think about it is. Uh, how, I look at it and I'm like, how did I do it? I'm, I'm just trying to question, you know, because um, I remember when I was 15, 16 years old, I was telling my parents, I don't want to live here. I want to go somewhere else. I want to travel the world yeah. and so on. And I'm the only one who did it in my family, my whole entire family members. Like, Well, I was going to ask you, how was, I mean, like I felt like I had to travel halfway around the world to go from Atlanta to LA. You physically went from around <laughs> yeah. the world. Yeah, I, so, I came mean, from what the... like? So I mean, it, it, it's interesting, and, and I don't know if you feel that way, but I felt sometimes like a big dumb American when I was no. out in LA, oh, and I was I like, see. "Yeah, we did it." But I would encounter uh, French artists and German mm. artists, and you know, buddies that worked at uh, Crytek, and the amount of work that they did to come into the states and get work visas or yeah. student visas, it really kind of started to put things in perspective, I'll, and I'll also be like. You know, you you need to yeah. step it up because like there's a lot yeah. of people out there. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, it's very clear. Um, the answer is, um, I know how down feels like. I know how being miserable feels like. I don't want to be there anymore. Yeah, you know what I mean. So so I had to do whatever it takes on my end, like do this work, do that work, learn hard surface, learn modeling, learn, learn texturing, work on this product, work on work on that product, you know, do whatever I can, reach out to companies, do, change the way I speak, uh, do as many interviews as I can, never give up because I wanted to, right? And then when I achieved this moment to move to US, I wasn't actually, I was more excited moving to US than working for companies, you know? Yeah. Uh, and and I'll tell you why, because uh, coming from a country where you have lim- no freedom space, no freedom at all, like it's not even limited, there's no freedom. Yeah. And uh, when I came here, I, 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 I saw how you can just live your life. You can 
surf the net however you like you can watch any movies you like you can drink whenever you want um, now you can smoke weed if you want if you don't want you don't have to right and uh, yeah i mean that's the reality like the, the, you can choose your life you can decide you can be a junkie or you can be a business owner who is um yeah on that on the top right and um growing as much as possible and i was like yeah this is what i want i want to have options i want to decide how my life is going to turn right and um the thing is, uh, that's the part that I, that I was very excited about, you know, that I can have these opportunities now and I can do a lot of things. You know, even something as simple as um, owning a gun as an example, right? If you want to own a gun, you yeah. can own a gun. No one is going to stop you. I'm not encouraging it. I'm not saying you should do it or you shouldn't. None of my business, but everyone is, um, I mean, they can decide if they want it or not. There's like, there are people against it. There are people support it, you know. Uh, but, but the good thing is, it's your choice, you know, it is your choice. And, uh, like the story is big, you know, if I, uh, want to talk about it, like when I, it's just weird because, uh, I was more excited about moving to us and less excited about getting my green card. And then when I became a citizen, it was just, I'm a citizen. I wasn't excited yeah. about it, but because I don't know how to explain it. It's not like I don't care about being a citizen. I love it. Like I'm, I'm super excited that I'm part of this country. I can vote. I can. There's like limitless opportunities, right? But yeah. I'm, but it just showed me that I can do what I want to do if I decide to, uh, to do it. You know, it's it's not just limited to working for one studio or moving to one country or. I don't know how to explain it. We live on on the same earth. It might be a bit too deep because. Yeah, you have to be in my perspective to understand the feeling, you know. And um, you know, moving from one city, like when I when I came to US, uh, it's funny because I moved from Florida to San Francisco, and then I went to LA and I told my friend, maybe I should move here. He was like, Oh, you need to find a job or something first. I was like, I'll find a job. Why? And I was like, dude, it's not hard, it's not easy. I'm like, I always <laughs> I, I completely agree with you because I always was like, even if I don't get a job after graduation and college, I'm moving out to LA. Like I'm going to go to that city and I'm that was find my a mindset. Make it work. Yep. And that was my mindset when I wanted to leave my country. Right. I said, I'm gonna do it and no matter what. And people yeah. were laughing at me at first. You know, I had friends that were like, oh you're always moving. What when when I remember the night when I got uh like we were going to fly in two nights, right? Uh, and I called my friend and I said, I'm moving. Do you want to meet? And it was like, he laughed and it was like, you always say you're moving. You wanted to go to Japan. You wanted to go to Australia. I said, okay, it's up to you. If you want to meet, let's meet tomorrow. Otherwise I'm going to leave. <laughs> and then next week is I'm like, you here. left. <laughs> He's like, I'm serious. I, I was yeah. leaving. That's and so I said, funny. yes, I left because that's what I wanted to do, dude. You think I, because, because I failed a couple of times, it doesn't mean I'm going to fail forever. That those failures actually taught me what I should do in order to be qualified to move. And I realized they say like USA is, is the land of opportunity. I actually believe in that. It's really land of, the land of opportunity. You can decide yeah. maybe less than in 70s or 60s, but you can still decide what you want to do for your life. Especially after the election, election I, I kind of realized, I mean, this is the country that I would support and I would do whatever it takes to help to, to grow it because, I mean, the opportunities are endless. You know, um, People can disagree with each other. People can live together at the same time. You know, even even though the political situation was bad last year, but I think it proved a lot of things. Like 2016, the election changed the politics, and then now again in a different way. So it kind of shows like we can live together. You know what I mean? And I absolutely agree. And this is an opportunity that honestly, I know there are haters. Some people don't like it. Don't like America for whatever reason. Uh, but, but I think you can grow. I came here with almost nothing, you know, and uh, I'm changing my life. My wife is working, growing in her career. And um, basically, yeah. So your question was, uh, I want to try to answer that question. I don't want to go like too sideways. I think it's but... great though. I think people want to hear that. And I think too, it's it's doing multiple things. Like being younger and hearing that it is extra motivation and i yeah. think it it puts it it's like what we were talking with the emotional intelligence stuff earlier of like 
removing yourself from your shoes where like I, I felt like I had so many mountains to climb over. You physically had mountains and seas to climb over, you know? And I, I think knowing that and put it in perspective. Uh, we have so, a little light. Sorry, yeah, I was fading away lights. there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things I can say is I never let anyone to tell me what I can do or what I cannot do, you know, because no one knows. No one knows mm -hmm. what I can do or what I cannot do. Like, I remember when I was younger, um, my uncle was always laughing because I had big dreams. I mean, the, the, he's my uncle, so it's fine. Whatever, <laughs> you know. But it turned out to be different, man. Like, I'm, uh, you know, I'm where I said I want to be. And it's interesting how much someone telling you you can't do something almost makes you want to do it more. Yeah, yeah. And because right? because that shows you're doing something special, you know. And for me, the motivation was freedom. I, I wanted freedom. I It wasn't just game industry. Yeah, I had fun. You know what's interesting? The first time that I, I play games since I was not, I, I don't play as much anymore. I actually don't play anymore because I don't have time. But I started playing games since I was five years old, right? And then um, I actually, even though I loved playing games, officially I, I thought about game industry in 2012, I think, or 13. I don't remember exactly. And the reason is because I when Unreal Engine, not the engine itself, what was it? Unreal Development Kit? Uh, yep. Okay. When it came out first, mm -hmm. I tried it and I was like, this is amazing. This feels great. Like it's different. So I should do yep. this. I should do game development. And I did some research. I realized, okay, I think it was 2011 or 10, something like that. And I realized if I do game development, I have a bigger chance of moving to US. I have a bigger chance of growing my career. I have a bigger ch chance of making a better life and so on. That's smart. And I, yeah. And I did that. And uh, it did. It gave me the result that I was after. Exactly. Now I'm actually thinking bigger. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, what, what am I going to do in the future? You know, podcast, teaching, all that. So possibilities are endless. But for me, when I moved to U.S., the feeling was, uh, yeah, it was great. That's like awesome. Going, yeah. It, like I said, it, it just puts things in perspective. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I appreciate I, it more, I, I guess. You know, sometimes I see some people, unfortunately, my, you know, other American friends that I have. Sometimes I, I tell them, I tell them, you really don't know what you have here. You really don't know. You, you can't lose this yeah you cannot lose this yeah it's, it's well something... it's interesting how much travel opens yeah. your mind yes right and i think True. one thing that i notice is the more that you travel and the more that you experience the more you can kind of open up a little bit yeah i feel very fortunate that i've been able to travel with the skill set that i've developed and through that it's I will admit, uh, like I, I do a lot of teaching for a, a school in Adelaide, uh, mm. in South Australia, uh, uh, CDW Studios, and I've thought about moving there multiple times. Like I absolutely love Australia. Mm. I don't mind being an American, but I do understand that compared to some other countries, uh, there are a lot of benefits that we have here. You know, oh, man, we're it's like endless. The, the advantage of it, like just that, that simple one, that spark just for me in just my little case of having Netherworld 20 minutes from where I grew up. It's totally different. Those stories are going to be different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then just to, just to put it in perspective, um, the first time I wanted to watch Alex Alwar's tutorials, you know, I had to go to my friend's office in Tehran and then they had them on their hard drive. I and I was watching it there and then coming home to just learn something. Yeah. And then I had to read, uh, you know, now at the time has changed. Now even people in Iran have access because of internet and so on. But it's much, much more limited comparing to what you have here. Uh, yeah. That I sounds mean, like the definition of motivation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. And like what going out of your way to find that, retain that information, like run home and practice it. Yes. Yes, exactly. And, uh, and look, now I live where Bungie is 30 minutes drive from me. You know, yeah. Valve is here. A yeah. Anytime I, I want to do it, I can just apply to them or talk to someone. Hey, I want to work mm -hmm. at uh, in Bungie. Do you know anyone there? I didn't have these yeah. opportunities, right? I mean, I don't know if Europe is the same. Europe, uh, it's a great place for sure. But I think the industry is much uh, more rewarding in U.S. in general.
like if you want to work in the game industry us is a lot more rewarding than other countries like when i when i listen when i hear about the salaries about the benefits and other things how much they pay on taxes and things like that i think yeah i know a lot of people uh, that are following me on facebook or friends or close friends they they will be against what i say but i think uh yeah i prefer us over anywhere big time well it goes to the saying uh grass is always greener right yep you know like it's the ability of if, if you grew up in adelaide you probably have a similar i want to get out to la right yeah. i want to get out to la and i want to do that and then as someone who's been to la and lived on the east coast there's parts of me that's like man i would love to be around some really good coffee and wine and a little bit more laid back lifestyle yeah grass is always greener so it's I, it's sometimes taking I feel like an appreciation of what you have yeah, and sometimes I feel like we're spoiled because uh, it's actually good. Not oh, spoiled. easily. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, no, we're, we're spoiled. We are, we're 100% spoiled. Spoiled, spoiled, right? Yeah. We're talking about fertilizer and fireworks of the 4th of July and, <laughs> yes. and salaries and paid benefits. Like, yeah, we are spoiled. It, it is so funny. The pandemic made me realize how fortunate we were, I think is maybe a positive way of spinning it right, yes. where I had neighbors who had more traditional jobs. Like, I don't know about you, but like, I don't know how any other industry works, right? Like I, I know about making games and making movies and making monsters. So to everyone else, it might be like foreign, right? Yeah. But like my neighbor, I, he does some sort of sales, you know, on the computer, this or that, like, I'm just like, I don't when the pandemic hits and, and it's affecting them, but I see us and we adapt to working home so easily, yep. you know, and, and checks came rolling in and even more work more, came yeah, in. More, more. Like I was like, Oh my God, like this is amazing. Like one, it made me think about like, what will be the big shift that will change that we'll need to learn and grow and adapt to. Um, but yeah, I felt very fortunate to be able to afford the lifestyle that I, I have with my family uh, and that I worked in an industry that, yeah, we're not curing cancer, but what I love is being able to tell stories and have a form of escapism for people. Hold on a second. Sorry. Okay. okay go ahead. Go ahead. You were saying this we're, part we're of talking. From yeah, it's part of working from home. Your dogs went crazy. My dogs are about to go crazy. We at Tripwire recently hired. Oh, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful dog. I have to go. Mine is second. definitely not as well behaved, uh, but she seems to be hiding somewhere. Uh, I'm talking about my dogs, not my yeah. daughters. But <laughs> I know. similarities there. Uh, they'll probably come smashing in here at any moment. Oh, the moment. The moment I had was we recently interviewed a new COO at Tripwire. This is the woman who's going to be my boss. And I was talking to her in the interview process of like, basically what I was telling you about Tripwire really uh, taking work-life balance to heart, uh, offering employees different things. How do we foster collaboration? And as I'm talking in these French doors in the background, my youngest just walks by naked and is just like, <laughs> waves and walks back and like all the other directors are like dude your kid is like me what there's like a five-year-old walking around i'm just like hey man sorry this is part of working at home i'll have to put some curtains up but <laughs> i don't know if you that, saw that that's interview. really been the only catastrophe yeah. that I've, I've had that happen are you talking about the one interview the news guy uh yes two kids coming into the room and then <laughs> Famous dude, one. as a, as a and dude, that guy, I feel so much for that scenario. I, I didn't laugh at it. It was just interesting. I think he was embarrassed. But yeah, I, there is nothing to be embarrassed. I was like, that's amazing. Like he can, that's a, that's a normal life. You know, that's that's what re it's reality is It's part of life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the newer life. generation is going to be more open about it because of YouTube, Instagram, and Instagram is a lot of fake stuff. But you know, I think eventually it's going to get filtered and more real. Uh, people are going to to show the reality instead of the fake reality. You know, it's not like well, I think with interviews like this, man, it's going to be way yeah. more real. Like I Hopefully. haven't had to pull the the usual conversation topics out of this. Like it's ranged from you know kind of fun funny stories to origin stories, and uh, that's why I was really excited to hear some of your origin story and <laughs> and you coming here because uh, it's really interesting to me. 
people in our industry to me are like superheroes and i want to know how they got there because i <laughs> legitimately do find that interesting <laughs> yeah sorry don't mind my dog he's your dog get... is totally into it as well yeah he's like he's just i'm gonna uh, remove his barking from the video <laughs> to make it what, easier for people what what type of dog it's a golden doodle that's what we got too, uh, lady. Uh, oh, I saw him. That was a golden doodle. Yeah, I wanted to see yeah that. that was a golden doodle. doodle. I had this guy for 13 years. Look Whoa, at look at that. Here's a wolf. <laughs> Creature Fox. design reference right Fox there. I the love wolf. it. The great, great color. <laughs> That's so fun. Yeah, we did the most typical things during the pandemic where we got a dog. So lady is still very much a puppy. Uh, and then I got into mountain biking with my, um, my oldest, my nine-year-old. Mm. Ooh, that was a magic trick. <laughs> yes. You like phased <laughs> yourself in there. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that's the trick. <laughs> but, you know, once again, I mean, to kind of tie that all back together, it's like different phases in life and that balance of. What I've loved about mountain biking is it reminds me of very my my early days of like CG and making art where it's mm -hmm. like you you have to totally focus on just that that it's your total yeah. attention like when you mountain bike you basically get to commit to just a little bit of feet in you front of you can watch a video on duo yeah so. <laughs> you're not yeah you're not thinking about this like I've crashed once and was lucky to walk away with like just a handful of stitches. That's interesting. And yeah. I was very like, wow. oh, I can only think about this. And and for me, like if if there's any CG artists or artists in general or anybody, you could you could be a banker. If you need a hobby that is I've never gotten into meditation or anything like that. And I, I get very bored with working out traditionally. It's a great way to have a physical fitness. Mountain but what biking. I love is, yes, but like you have to think only about mountain biking. When did you start it? I want to get a bike. It's expensive. Literally, so it's about, a, literally about a year ago. Yeah, that's the oh. only thing I would say. Like, dude, you want to talk about privilege is, yes. is mountain biking. Dude. Like I see <laughs> certain guys now and I'm just like, if you can afford a mountain bike, you're, you have a very privileged life. <laughs> There is a I got a here. very introduction. Yeah, they probably do great. They uh, yeah, probably did amazing yeah. during the pandemic. This uh, I actually went to buy a bike. I didn't. I bought a table saw instead. But I might buy a bike okay. again. Yeah, yeah, it's still expensive. Expensive. I bought a saw stop, and uh, yeah, the, you're the, getting into yes. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're you're full it's, on into it. Yeah, yeah. I want to do a stuff. I'm actually making making a chair now. I want to finish that. But like I said, mountain biking. I actually saw a bike for six and a half thousand. It's expensive, and it is. It I, is. I'm either buying that or not. So that's that's the thing that I'm talking about. Like if I could come out of Iran and move here, I mean six thousand dollars to buy a mountain bike. I can find a way to do it. You know, I, I almost well, yeah, them. and yeah, there, just to find that is amazing, right? Yeah, like, yeah. And, and even then, like, so for me, the way I got started is I went uh, and I bought a, a giant. It was like the giant Talon V2, which I think maybe was like, I bought the 2020 edition. I think maybe it was like 800 bucks, you know, which hmm. even still 800 bucks is a lot of money. And um, uh, one of yeah, these? that thing, um, giant Talon V2. If, if you, yeah. So yeah, giant, I've really enjoyed their bikes. There are definitely way more high end See, bikes. This is like expensive. <laughs> Yeah, look for oh, like, like the five, the five to eight hundred dollar mark because that is the perfect like entry level mountain mm -hmm. bike, where you can do most things. Like to be perfectly honest, I've looked at some nicer bikes recently. They're mm -hmm. not going to make me a better mountain biker. I just might be a little more fashionable out there. Yeah, well, I mean, but the, the difference is like the body is yeah, focusing. the body. Sorry, the body is carbon fiber. There's a better you know spring system and so on. So that's the difference. I'm still I'm yeah. still the same fat guy on the bike though. Like I can <laughs> I can shed a few pounds with a carbon carbon frame, but uh to be honest, I should probably shed those pounds on myself first. 
<laughs> but yeah, I I've loved it, man. It's a uh, one. It's a nice way to. I have coworkers that we ride with, and it's a way for us to bond over something that is not game development. Mm -hmm. There are friends that are outside of game development that I can foster those relationships. Uh, my daughter, she got really into riding. So my nine-year-old, it's like her and I's way of bonding. You know, like we mm. went for a ride yesterday uh, and it was really, really nice. So yeah, um, that's, that's I, I thing. recommend it. I really recommend I'm it. I'm going to get one, especially after what you said. But I'm just like debating because I have this bad habit. Uh, I don't know if it's bad or not because I had... Maybe it's not bad. I, I had I have bad experience with buying uh, stuff that are on a lower price, but I, I, every time I bought something expensive, it lasted me a long time, you know. And I realized it I, I buy it once, and I will I will never have to buy it. So I'm, I'm like so, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that makes me kind mean. of wait and then you know buy it when I don't have to change it again. I, I had that same concern, and that's why I went with like an eight hundred dollar because you could find like a four three four hundred dollar bike at like REI, yeah. but like it's really not going to kind no, of like check yeah. most of the yeah. boxes for you. But to know that you're going to love a five thousand dollar bike is difficult. Like you've never done yes. it before, so eight hundred was a, a great price point. The other thing that you can do is you can look at local trails, and a lot of times you can rent bikes to see if it's something. Because oh, for me, the first time that I got on a mountain bike, I was it, it reminded me of ZBrush. I'd put it in that same category where the first time I had my first interaction with it, I was like, "Oh, this is a thing I do now." Like I, I enjoy I'm it. going to look at mountain biking, <laughs> like my Instagram feed. If you want to know everything about me, my Instagram feed is the things that I like. It is artists, you know, it's like guys like yourself and Raph and, you know, uh, Jared Morantz and Zach Berger, like all of these monster making creative guys. And then it's going to be mountain bikers, <laughs> Your Instagram, mountain bike right? companies. Yeah, and then it's going to be like uh, basically or? like all the people that all the people I follow. Like if you were to look at the followers I have, oh, uh, it's all stuff. Like I try to cater Instagram to being the things that bring me joy. So it's like artists, mountain biking, and like lawn care stuff. Oh, <laughs> it is I'm the so same. <laughs> specifically geared to the things that like bring me joy. I, I bought a piano in two thousand and. Uh... 16 i think 17 okay yeah so i bought a piano ago. yeah and then i i wanted to change uh 2018 i wanted to buy a, a, a grand piano i didn't know which one to buy and so on so i did a, a lot of research and i bought this one exactly this piano so this guy is showing it this is my piano <laughs> and, that's crazy uh, yes and now it's putting a lot of things in perspective from where you've traveled to life to your buying grand pianos <laughs> I definitely think it's safe to say that you've led a successful life. Where, well, where do you keep a Where do you keep a grand? I, listen, I can only say so much. I'm sitting in a room full of bones and monster kits and comic books. Like I get it. I get it. Where do you keep a grand piano, though? Uh, it's in my living room. That's oh a problem God, because I, I can't it. play it, man. Like I can't play all the time. You know, <laughs> I play a bit in the morning, and then my wife is like, "Oh, it's too loud in the evening." So. Uh, well, to... what is the kind of saying of like, um, it, with, this goes towards a lot of game developers. Like you're talking about how you don't play that much. I still like, I, I have to play. Uh, I'm, I'm addicted. It's, it's one of the reasons I still do this. Like consuming media, one as a creative director is one of the most uh, essential parts of my job to kind of have a, a pulse on the industry of like what games are popular, what movies are popular, what comics are, are kind of yeah. treading in new areas. Um, but it's funny, man, like the older we get and the more responsibility, like, yes, we have the funds because it's like you have all of the money, but none of the time when like 20 years ago, you had none of the money and all the time. Yeah, I don't have all so. the money now. It's, it's still a long way, but yeah, I could oh, afford yeah, to buy we, we... <laughs> <laughs> I could afford to buy this piano. That's one thing. Yeah. But you know, um, uh, it's, 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 it's funny because, um, uh, the more it goes, life goes forward, the more I realize I actually understand the possibilities and how much fun I can have with other things. You talked about the mm -hmm. bubble, you know? Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and in our age, you said, uh, I think my transition started at age 33. I think that's the, that's the age that happens okay. to everyone. They, they start changing at 33. 
And I love uh, it. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna steal it. This guy, look, <laughs> like, <It's> so good. <laughs> and with your like your high def camera, like <laughs> it, I, it's funny. This is the social media thing we're talking about too. Where I was like, man, I wish my dog was that well behaved. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> he's he's not well behaved yet. He's he's crazy. He's five months old. I got him like two months ago. Oh, yeah, there they are. There. Your dog is there. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, I mean. Uh, the more I do other things, I realize... Actually, I was into playing chess. Now I'm thinking to build a chess for myself. Now that I'm doing woodworking so I can play the chess that I, I make myself, you know? It'll be fun. So it's not... Uh, that's the thing. Like, I'm trying to get out of the bubbles. Uh, a friend of mine said it's midlife crisis. I, I know it's not mid midlife crisis. It's just me trying to understand... I think it's uh, maturing. Maturing, yes. It, I, I Now I understand it's not just... Life is not about only this game or that title or any, any of that. It's more about... Or that um, company name. Yes. Right? It's more about journey. When I get old, I actually forget about the games that I worked on sometimes. People ask, which game? I'm like, oh, oh yes, I worked on Call of Duty. Yeah, I forgot that. Yeah. You know what I mean? That, well, that's a reaction. You, yeah. Do you remember like one of the first ship titles you worked on? You'd be given a character. Maybe it was like at that time, one of the more significant characters, maybe like your first boss, right? I your think first the first game, uh, yeah. I think it was Borderland, but I was just, I, I didn't even play the game. It's interesting. Yeah. You well, know, that's one just, funny thing. It puts it in perspective, right? Yeah. I'll was, never forget the first boss I worked on and it being like, this is going to be like one of those moments of finding ZBrush or finding a mountain bike, right? Where you're yeah. like, this is going to be life changing. And you look back, you can barely kind of like, you have some cool stories to tell from it. Yes. And you have good memories and maybe you failed and you learned a few things, but the impact that you had on it, it's not to say that making art doesn't have that. Cause I I've worked on some projects that have opened doors for me and have mm -hmm. taught me certain things. Um, but I think it's important to know that things like buying a piano and, and learning to, to play music or to ride a bike or to, to, to build a chair yeah those are equally as important as some of the other elements and and those experiences help us become better game developers and better artists as well like I'm recently, human beings like appreciating everything you know Not yeah just, you know yeah, yeah go ahead. You, I, you I use well i use mountain biking as an analogy for a lot because like game development is hard Right, it is. right. It's like stressful. everyone thinks how amazing it is. It's super stressful. It is very similar to me as mountain biking, where you know what the most enjoyable part of mountain biking is for me? Being done. Like putting my truck or putting my bike back in the back of my truck and like wiping the sweat from my oh, brow. That's interesting. Is like that achievement of like, I just rode X amount of miles. I just climbed a, or I, I went through a new trail I've never been through before. It's having that uh, very clearly defined goal and achieving it. And there are parts where you're like climbing and it sucks. That's like game development, right? Where you're like, normal maps aren't baking right. You're breaking the game. You had a, a conflict with a coworker. You get through all that stuff to get to the finish line where you can take a minute and kind of enjoy it. You know, you know the, the only time for another ride. Yeah, and the, the, that's actually reminds me of this. The biggest issue I have with the game industry, I don't know, issue is the right word or not. You have to wait a long time, like three, four years. Until yeah. you see the result. A, a really long time. Yeah, and you know what happens? You get used to it. That's what happens to any material thing. It's a it's it's just something you achieve, right? And then when the product comes out, people ask me, How do you feel about shipping this game? Nothing. Because I'm I'm yeah. used to it now. I can't tell you how I feel. I used to feel something, yeah. but we have short memories, right? That feeling goes away and you forget about how it feels. Like like I say, you know. People have short memories. They forget about bad things and they forget about good things. And they repeat the same mistakes and they do the same good things because another reason limited. for the importance of post mortems, right? <laughs> yes. Because it's funny, like everyone's like, hey, we forgot about all that crunch we did because the game shipped and it, we got a bonus and we got some ice cream and we got a pat on the back where it's like, whoa, 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 dial back six months when we were all about to kill each other. Let's yeah. talk about that. <laughs> yes, yes. Exactly. So we can learn to improve that part, right? I, I so. think it's because the industry is not mature enough. It's a very young industry, right? I mean, 
uh, at its current yeah. form. Maybe since 2004, it became more serious. I mean, just how much it changed, like thinking about what Tripwire used to be. Tripwire has been around for a little over 15 years. Mm. What it was 15 years ago, where it's a few guys inside, you know, someone's garage, right? And then moving into like a church or, you know, even you look at the, the humble beginnings of id Software, right? Yep. Where like, you know, it's a, a handful of guys making something, you know, and, and sharing it around. Um, Could be Maya's story. Has, Who knows? It has changed. Yeah, it could yeah. be the same thing for like uh, when you say that I'm like, who knows what's gonna happen to to my podcast if I'm gonna continue it, if it's gonna grow, if it's gonna like maybe one day it's gonna change to something much bigger. I'm I'm doing it in my, my room right now. My kids could be yeah, my kids could be streaming this and YouTube later. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> yeah. god, like you never know. Yeah, if, exactly. If if our kids stream it on YouTube, then we know we've got a success. Yeah, yeah. Usually That's one thing like I that. will say. Is, yeah, what's that? Say again. No. Just knowing like what it's as a creative director, I'll, I'll often look to like what my kids or even as a parent, I should just say like, what are, what are my kids finding popular? Like, what are the things that are catching my kids interest? And it's so funny. Like you want perspective as a game artist, how much time, especially from character art where like I, I have, I watched every, you know, geo napkin sculpting video and I'm putting every amount of form and to fold and, and form following function this is going to be the best foot on a creature ever not to discredit any of that. It's amazing. It's a huge part of it. But when I get a healthy dose of reality is when I see the games that my kid and yeah. all her friends are playing like Roblox. It's and it's different. literally like the most simple character ever. I'm like, Oh my God, like this or like Fortnite, right? Like the yeah. type of art I make is very different from Fortnite. And I see what's popular. And you're like, Oh man, like this it is a, this change. is a wake up call. Uh, well, it's funny how you're talking about like going back and playing games. Um, I I've loved this conversation. It's been awesome. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I don't know if I'll come back and listen to myself, but hopefully someone will listen to this. And I think it's good. Kind of get a glimpse. You can know, uh, like usually when we talk, I, I don't like to listen to myself. I'm used to myself now because of editing videos. Yeah. But I can guarantee it. it it's a great conversation. It's very engaging. I like it and I enjoy it. So far, it's that's awesome. Like, yeah, yeah, one of the great ones. <laughs> I told you from it, the well, beginning. Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate. It. Well, we talked. We were nervous, or I, or I would say I was nervous because, like, what can I talk about? Because whatever movies or games that I'm working on yeah. for literally the past X amount of years, I can't ever talk about until years later. So that's another thing talking about. Like, how do you feel when something ships? You know, like, yeah. Things get delayed. Things get pushed back. There's movies that I've worked on recently that were canceled that you'll never get to see stuff. You know, like it gets old. And you even know, for me as an art, it gets old fast. You know, I, when I got my when I moved to US, uh, I came here with uh, O1 visa. When I got my visa and moved here, it was more exciting to me than green card, right? Because I'm mm -hmm. used to it now. I'm in the in the US, and then when I got my citizenship, it was again less exciting. Not not to. Like it was a big achievement. I loved it, and it's. Uh, I still think about it. How did I achieve all that, and so on? Uh, Were you desensitized to it a little bit? Like it just was kind of like part of the motion. Yeah, because I knew it's going to happen. You know, it was a it yeah. was the reality. I knew it's going to it's it's going to happen at this point. You know, I did I did a lot of things, so this is part of it. But what I'm saying is like I think the same thing is in the game industry. Like you work on a product for m months and years, and then it just it just becomes something normal. It's not that exciting anymore you know and when mm -hmm. it ships you're like yeah that's great you have uh, a, a big moment and then that's it you know if you want to have a, a conversation number two i think the one thing we could talk about is uh remaining inspired i think that's good we can do that and, and not becoming jaded because that's one thing that i've always tried to pride myself on because i remember uh, like starting off as an intern at General Giant and meeting, or even before working at General Giant in Atlanta, we have a big convention called Dragon Con. And I remember meeting artists that I'd looked up to for a very long time and could tell like they were not into this at all. And that's one thing I, I hope people understand that we, you and I are talking about pianos and mountain bikes and lawns and table saws. It's not that there isn't a passion for artwork and game development i think you grow as a person and you want to try and do more things um i but still there love is making characters yeah, yeah i still love look i'll show you now 
while you talk, because I'm sure you kind of like Let's this see. kind of characters. This yeah, is... Of course I do. It's got a bunch <laughs> of armor and it's a tough guy. Like, I'll tell you, like, I avoid making female characters because it's like, I want monsters and tough guys. Like, it's a kid of the 80s. I want Predator. <laughs> so uh, I still enjoy it. If I didn't, I'm making this for my class, right? But I'm yeah. coming to this conclusion that this is not everything. It doesn't reduce from the amount of great work I have to do this. You know, it doesn't uh, mm -hmm. downgrade the, the, the type of work. Uh, you know, it's amazing that, that I can create something that doesn't exist in a computer, you know, rotate around it and enjoy it. But, you know, that profile is um, awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I, I still need to work on it. But, you know, I'm, I'm doing this for my student, right? And yeah. the purpose is beyond me. It's not like, oh, I'm going to get famous for this and uh, I'm going to get a portfolio piece. I actually haven't updated like, my portfolio for the past, I don't know, maybe four proper update right four years something like that just i'm right with you yeah my art station is pretty stagnant yeah because it's also changing man like instagram is taking over i've gotten more work from instagram because here's the thing that uh instagram has and it's art stations had it as well like i i won't deny it um there was a few projects that one if you're a student, always make sure that your name is clearly visible on a piece of artwork that you did because a production designer or an art director is going to grab a bunch of images from online and post it up on a board and kind of be like, hey, this is kind of what we're thinking the creatures could kind of look like. And then your name is not There's, there. Yeah. When your name's not there, they're going to be like, oh, well, we'll hire so-and-so and he can do something similar. We'll point it to that. I can't tell you how many times I've done a personal piece and it's gotten pulled for you know a piece of inspiration and my name will be on there and be like oh just let's contact that guy and we'll get him to do some stuff for it and when i would get the notes it would be like oh we found this image that you did just make it like this wow. and you're like oh okay that works really well and then the other power now is with instagram is like be involved in the community like follow directors, follow production designers, communicate with them, like their images and, and be sincere. Like don't make them be fake engagements, but it's like what we were talking about working remotely uh, or having a conversation like this. Like we've never met, never met in person. It's our first yeah. time meeting and we'll we can meet. have an we'll in conversation. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, but like having those online conversations, it is something I, I don't want to say it's new, you know, the internet's been around for a while, but like, especially now because of the pandemic where like you can easily work remotely being on Instagram and sharing art and staying consistent is where I'm getting most of my freelance work from, you know, it is yeah. directors reaching out. Oh, cool. You did stuff for this. And once again, it's that snowball effect. It just kind of keeps rolling. I'm getting good students from Instagram. Like, uh, yeah, I, I absolutely. And, and, uh, you know, that's why, look, I mean, I think I enjoy I enjoy teaching a lot, and I'm trying to grow it more now. It's fun because uh, you know I, I forced myself. Look, I mean, I will show you something cool. I, I forced myself to make this head in two hours and a half in the class. And let me see if wow. I have the previous version. Yeah, it's funny. Like, look at this. This is just a concept. I was just putting something to work on the armor. But look at the difference. The, because of the class, I had to force myself to do it as fast as possible to show everything in one class not everything but up to up to a certain point and uh, you know or or the whole armor i didn't record a video i did everything live for the students for my students you know it's Even, amazing yeah i also made a i don't know if you saw the summary armor i can show it to you if you want did it's you great just, yeah I mean, oh i follow you on instagram i like i said i get involved with that i, I uh, it's awesome yeah, it's, and it's so much did fun. Did you do right? that live for your yeah, students as well? Yeah, everything live, and yeah. uh, it's it's fun. Because Brave it, man, I love it. <laughs> I don't know. I I like jumping into unknown waters. Like I don't know what's going on, and I, this is actually mm -hmm. something we can talk about it more. I, I know your time is limited, but maybe that's also another great conversation because uh, recently, like we were talking about uh, what do you call it, a midlife crisis, and trying to mature and get to the yeah whatever you know, grow up and so on. Uh, I actually, but even like growing, like you're talking about, like, you know, too, if you wanted to, like, I would love to do some artwork. Like one thing that's really been pushing me recently is just drawing more. Like, how mm. can I communicate the same idea with less strokes? Yeah. I, I never, I, I loved drawing before and I didn't 
continue doing it. And I realized, um, I, I think I realized this about myself that I like to create a stuff that have volume, you know, mm -hmm. that's why I'm into woodworking. Like I, I yeah. enjoyed the first thing I made. I enjoyed it when it was just a box. It was compl It's more complicated than, than you think. You know, I just wanted to make a cutting board. When I started working on it, I realized, oh damn, I need this many tools. I need to work on this. I need to measure it this way. There's a lot of things involved that I have no idea because in 3D, it gives me this option to just create a box, finish, done. I have That's a cutting it. board. Done. Yeah. But in reality, yep. it's not like that. You have to glue it, wait for a day, make sure the glue is working. <laughs> Your daughter wants you back. <laughs> we, we, yeah, they. <laughs> There's that competition coming in where it's like, check this out. Watch what I can do. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the thing, man. I mean, uh, yeah, part of the, I forgot what I wanted to say. I, I was like part of the growing thing. Um, I think I'm realizing stuff that I didn't understand before, that I didn't realize before. And, uh, you know, I'm just questioning what do I really want to do? What do I, where do I want to go in 20 years? Because 20 years ago, when I was 15, 16, I wanted to be here, right? Now I'm here. Yeah. So maybe, uh, what do I want when I'm 56? What, what is it that I want exactly that I, I'm living? Uh, and it, it'll life, probably right? change, right? And it'll so, be interesting, like what is consistent and then what is different. The thing that I think that I would take away from our biggest conversation here is focusing on what you want to do. Like one of your first questions was like, how did you know that you wanted to do monsters, yeah. right? And I think a lot of that comes down to the being honest with yourself. Do you want a mountain bike? Try it. Do you want yeah. to learn to play the piano? Decisiveness. Try it, right? Yeah. There's a lot, and I think this relates to game developing as well as like, you don't know what something is going to be like until you try it. So True. get out there, try a bunch of stuff. It's going to snowball. You might fail. You might fall off that bike. You might get a few stitches. You might get a good story to tell. But just to counter those, there's going to be some... That's interesting. You know, I'll tell you downhill something. and some, some uh, moments of you succeeding as well. I'll give you my own statistic, something that I actually figured because of my classes. Um, mm -hmm. No offense to anyone. I, I hope people understand this because it's, it might be sensitive. What I realized is when I get a student, those who ask less questions and do more, they become more successful. Like they advance more in their art. I have a mm -hmm. student, they come to me for the first time and they say, I want to come into your class. I'm like, did you check the description everything? Yes. Are you, are you down? Yeah. Sign me in. That's it. They come in. They don't talk about anything. They, they just start decisiveness. If he likes it after a month, he's going to continue for, for a longer time. Obviously yeah. it's from a year ago. And, uh, actually I can say hundred percent of the time, those who asked a lot of question and they were not decisive because they didn't know what they want to do. They didn't sign up before the class. Some of them completely gave up CG without even doing it. Some of them asked many questions. They didn't come to my class. They came to my class. They didn't know what they want to do. They went back again. So they're in this loop going back and forth, a small number. And I realized, yeah. okay, so there is a link between decisiveness and uh, success. You have to be decisive. You, you don't have to think about the outcome. It doesn't matter. Like if I wanted to actually think, is there racism in the U.S.? Am I going to be called a terrorist? Am I going to face this? Are they going to arrest me on the border because I'm from Iran? You know, I would get overwhelmed and not do it, right? So yeah. that's why I said I like to try uncharted territories, uncharted waters. And I realized that about myself. That makes me a happy person. Like jumping into yeah. something that I don't know what's the result, what's the outcome. You know, when I started YouTube, uh, if you watch my first video, maybe I will share it again. I, I close it because I want to watch it again after two years. Because it's interesting yeah. when you co come back to it, you, you realize where you, where you come from, you know, a new journey. The yeah. thing I did was this. I made a video. It was funny. It was stupid. It was a lot of things, but it wasn't what, what I'm doing here now with you, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I published it and I shared it on Facebook. A friend of mine messaged me and he, he was laughing. Another friend of mine was like, you're wasting time. What is, why are you doing this? You can do something else to make money. <laughs> it's just interesting. And I was like, I don't care. I don't care. I just want it to be out there. Let those who want to laugh, let them laugh at it. And uh, yeah. I'll get over this moment and then I'm going to continue and I'm going to improve. And 
something is going to change and I'm going to do something better. It wasn't an interview and then turned into these interviews. And then who knows what's going to happen after this, right? And yeah, uh, where does it grow? Yeah. And the same friend that was actually laughing at me, he messaged me a year after when I was starting these interviews. And he was like, your YouTube is growing. That's great. I'm like, you remember what you told me that day, that night? And I was like, no, I never said that. I said, I have your chat. What are you talking about? It's here. You wrote you wrote it to me. You were Look, at it's me. right yeah, here. It's, it's right. I have it framed. <laughs> I have a screenshot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is the thing. Uncharted territories are scary. It's unknown because it's you could could be dangerous. A lot of things could happen. Maybe maybe we'll sleep and we'll not wake up tomorrow. It doesn't mean that you it's... have to, you know. Sometimes asking too many questions is bad. Questioning your stuff is good, but too many questions will stop you from acting. Acting is always better than questions because you're going to answer your questions without asking them. One one kind of last thing I'll, I'll kind of mention, and I, I think you're kind of bringing up here, is even with 15, 16 years of experience and, and doing freelance and whatnot, the hardest part of every job is getting started. Yep. Just having that motivation to, I mean, it's literally as simple as getting up in the morning, taking a shower, getting your cup of coffee, going for a bike ride, whatever, whatever the thing that you need to do to kind of get the ball rolling, you know, or like, you know, tonight after this meeting, I'll put my kids to bed and I'll do some freelance and sitting down to that blank canvas to get started on pushing through that barrier is the hardest part and it yeah, never yeah. goes away and it's it's that determination and being decisive of like we said we're going to do this let's let's do this right like let's jump into this right now yeah. so yeah exactly that's why i live on iced coffee lots of lots of iced <laughs> coffee to help with that yeah i mean um, mine is changing my uh yeah, I change all the time. Like I have different topics that I follow. Sometimes I'm into investments. Sometimes I listen to classical mu music. Depends on my mood in the morning. Sometimes I'm depressed okay. and I don't want to listen to anything. But it changes. <laughs> <laughs> so I it, have to admit, I am a, I'm, you know, like most nerdy guys in our industry, I'm a, a sucker for red letter media. Listening to their perspective on on filmmaking and storytelling, mm. uh, I really enjoy those guys. Um, that's cool that and a, a cup of coffee in the morning uh is usually the way i kind of yeah get, I, I, get like I like tea i like to drink okay a lot of tea. nice lot of tea. <laughs> uh, if you're ever wondering what the worst thing is to spill in your refrigerator i'll share a, a challenge i had of uh it was like two nights ago my wife was like hey you didn't make any cold brew coffee and i was like honey i got it it was like 11 o'clock at night I, you know, did the coarse grind. I put it in and, you know, it's basically almost like making tea, right? Where it's just like a very big thing. And you got this uh, big, uh, essentially kind of pot that is full of water and coarse ground coffee in like a little container. And I went to put it in the fridge and I wasn't paying attention. And you dropped it. When I set it down, dude, it is literally the worst thing that you could <laughs> spill is like poop juice and coffee grounds is like everywhere inside so i think we were up for like another hour cleaning the fridge so when i said my wife keeps me humble uh i, I was not lying there that's true. uh she was also very supportive and very helpful cleaning that up so but uh on that note uh, i better go help with getting the kids to bed yeah let's do that uh, but i uh, down... i cannot thank you enough oh dude for this was great fight. No, thank cool. you for joining because I think it was a great conversation. I, you know, a lot of things. You, it was the deepest in. conversation I've yeah, had in yeah. a long time pertaining to, you know, <laughs> making deep. Conversations. I, we hit it. Yeah, we hit it. Yeah. Hitting, making from ice brew coffee to working in the industry. Uh, yeah, I would I would love to talk to you again. So we thank should you do that. Definitely. Invite. And uh, sounds good. So, yeah, I'm going to finish this. Uh, just hang on for a second. Uh, Whatever you need I to do. Ask for you something sure. quickly. So please. That's it. I don't know. Do you want to say anything else to people? I don't know. Last thing? No? Uh, I mean, I would just say, like, last thing as always is, like, thank you for taking the time to kind of listen to us. You know, right. I, I think yeah. giving right. people time is a, a, a really valuable thing, and I feel really respected, and I feel uh, very valued. So hopefully you got some sense of uh, enjoyment. Yep. Uh, maybe either I learning agree. from some of our mistakes or, you know, you <laughs> yes. got a little uh, inspiration as well. So, yeah, thanks for uh, not only your time, but your viewers' time. I really appreciate it. it yeah, really nice. I agree. I agree.